What? Yeah, we're on the internet. When was the, first of all, like, when was the first time you became aware that watching people play video games online was a thing that you could do? Um, shit, when I, when I flipped the script. Um, like, when when did I realize it could actually be a job? Um, no, no, not, not even a job. Like, simply, like, you, I, I, sorry, maybe this is too forward. How old are you? <laughs> no, no, mate, it's all good. Uh, so, yeah. Chauderous, <laughs> come on in. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> Patrick's already interviewing me. This is fucking great. <laughs> um, so I'm 37. I'll be 38 this year. Okay, cool. So you and I are like right in the same window. So in general, yeah. like when did you realize like, oh, I'm playing video games here with, with my hands. I'm playing uh, Xbox, original Xbox. Holy shit, I can watch videos of people playing uh video games on the computer or i can just sit on the game uh the game spot website and just watch the infinite roll of stuff that publishers send them that they just upload god um it had to be around like 2011 2012 is when i realized this was a thing that i i wanted to watch and people enjoyed mm -hmm. um so to a bit of my history is that i always hated uh old school developer diaries you know, like the the really like 2000s hella produced, like developer sits in a chair and goes, really, we're trying to bring you the cutting edge of, I don't know, smacking a snowman in the genitals. And we really think that with our technology, we could make it happen. Like I hated those. And then when I started interacting more with like the, the OG YouTube crowd, I was like, oh shit, this is a genuine way of doing it. And mm that once i realized that there was something to be had in the genuineness of it not just watching like pre-constructed gameplay trailers i was like ah oh, shit yeah this slaps nice um yeah i don't for me i don't think it was probably around the same time yeah 2011 but like i'd see like even earlier like 2003 or 2004 there was this thing on i think it was GameSpot's website it was just their video section and it was literally just like i think it, it now that i've worked in the industry for a little while i i can i believe it was just like any b-roll a publisher sent them any trailer like literally anything yep. that came in their pr line that had like a video file attached to it they would just digitize it and put it on there so it was just like watching trailers for onimusha 3 and shit and then the next video would come up and it would have nothing to do with the previous video and i would just sit there and watch it and i was like hey it's this is how i learned about video games hey i mean god bless GameSpot because like they are usually the go-to people for that one obscure video for that one press asset that no one else talks about yeah no i i found some very valuable stuff on their youtube channel for one of my videos um, um so to everybody who's just joined us wato and welcome um, we're probably going to just do some ambient bantamancy because Patrick's been helping me try and troubleshoot a buttload of problems this morning. Like, it's been a fucking journey. Um, and then once the, the crew's all in, then I'll introduce you all to Patrick Popper. We'll get into the, the bants. You all will be weapons free to ask Patrick questions or what have you. But yeah, friends, get yourself a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, whatever you need. Um, I didn't get the chance to do our usual preamble and bantamancy, so we're all doing it together. <laughs> um, I figure, because it usually takes people about 20 minutes, half an hour to be able to get into a stream when it kicks mm -hmm. off. Uh, I just talk with everybody until usually a guest comes in. <laughs> yeah, caffeine, lower the question, Howard, sir. We're not there yet. <laughs> um... Uh... But yeah, yeah, okay. So if Banter you want time. if you want to get into the old magics while we're waiting for everybody to get in, fucking yeah. gametrailers.com having yes. wild shit like Monty Ohm's original stuff and Hey Ash what you're playing alongside mm -hmm. super hyper produced trailers. That was my weird little bubble for a long time. Yeah. That was yeah, my I, I I spent a lot of time on that website. Um watching literally everything screw attack would put a lot of their stuff up there oh I god remember. yeah i always forget they were game trailers yeah and... um what was the game trailers they're, they're also the people who went to the one of my favorite video game videos on the computer is the um the one where they go to the launch of the nintendo wii and they find this guy there with his friends and he's the the, the sleep with the game baby game with play all night that guy 
Uh, he, says, what is, he says, I'm all hopped up on Demerol and grape soda. <laughs> <laughs> uh, God, um, uh, I think I still, uh, on a PC somewhere, I still have Elijah Wood's Xbox announcement videos mm. for the big, it was either the launch or the reveal. Um, mm -hmm. And I definitely, I don't know where it is anymore, but I definitely had the Fred Durst signing Dreamcasts. Oh, that's so good, man. Yeah, as I get older, uh, I start, I, I'm starting to feel like this archivist instinct mm. where I'm just like scared of all this stupid ephemera that's being lost. And I'm like, oh, do I need to buy a huge hard drive and start like archiving things? It kind like, of feels uh, that way. Cause like, it feels like we've got a real handle on most parts of like the, the games media sphere now. Mm -hmm. and, like there's still weird snafus and strange stuff that can happen, but like, during like the the crossover to the like the ps2 dreamcast like classic xbox era like every it was just throw spaghetti at the wall like and some of those events were fucking unhinged yeah. and i'm so worried about losing them yeah i i i am i completely missed all that stuff because i i came into the industry when it became normal <laughs> uh <laughs> I never got to see a, a goat get slaughtered in an E3 party or like nobody ever put me in a fighter jet uh, to get me excited for ace combat, which is fine. I don't need those things. It's fine. Um, Actually, uh, the only one I think that you missed, um, I, I wasn't there, um, Susan Ahn, um, who's uh, obviously fucking wonderful and has been a lovely guest on the show, got to do the Tabula Rasa launch event where Richard wow. Garriott turned his castle into a war zone. <laughs> Someone got lost in the castle for three hours. Like, where was all the money coming from? Where him, did all man. the money come from back then? Yeah, Richard. Yeah, I guess he is. He's a lord. <laughs> he can do that if he wants. He had that ultimate money. He had that Lord British Bank. <laughs> uh, I finally saw. I I finally. I think for the first time ever, actually looked at gameplay of one of the Ultima games, and I think it was like. It was like you were playing as a guy playing an MMO. Is that what those games are all about? Uh, so the OG Ultimas were weird in that they were kind of like an evolution on Rogue and Nethack, but with more gotcha. of a focus on you being the avatar of the gods. But okay. the character creation was a personality quiz. Like, you know, you see a damsel in distress, what do you do? That kind of thing. Uh, or I think one of them had you choosing tarot cards. It was mm -hmm. feckin' weird. And then Ultima Online was the one that made the crazy money. Uh, and then after he worked on that for a gajillion years and I think tried to do a few different like Ultima 3Ds and whatnot, that was when he went and did Tabula Rasa, which was going to be the next big the next big thing in mm -hmm. MMOs. Um, and I think it lived and died even before World of Warcraft. Yeah, I remember I remember seeing like news or like reports from the ground of the event when they shut it down. Mm. I think that they actually did put together like a big end game event for it read the whole thing yeah but um stopped so here's the weird things so, like i didn't get into the industry proper until like what 2010 i think it was after the recession mm -hmm. i just started working for sega qa i've just been mm -hmm. like you know those people who get too into fantasy football hello amos i know um it's my dog uh, the one i was yelling at whilst we were trying to sort things out um I have been obsessed with not just games, but the whole industry and space around it. So like, mm -hmm. I kind of can't help but deep dive into these things. So I wasn't part of the industry during the goat slaughtering phase or otherwise, but did I have to look up the entire Sin to Win campaign and understand it? Yes. God, ah, that one. That Sin one to Win. Sin to Win. That, that is, I, I know about that one because of Matt McMuscles, who is one of my favorite YouTube guys. Uh, he's the the, the Wahopin guy, uh, and he 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 seems like he's really really good at research. Uh, he he seems to get like a lot of like first um first hand sources um on those stories. But yeah, the, the sin to win thing was not good. <laughs> Well, so what's wild is that like people love talking about this stuff. It's just up until recently, no one asked. No one wanted to yeah. know who put together a marketing campaign or who it was that chained a sledgehammer to a car for the launch of uh, Red Faction Armageddon. Mm -hmm. um, 
But yeah, sorry. Possible good name. Here's me talking to you, talking Yuri off. So friends, what a and welcome. I hope you are having a splendid Thursday. Um, we are joined by the wonderful Patrick Gill, and uh, we'll be doing proper intros and stuff in a second. So if you'll want to get a cup of tea, get a cup of coffee, or what have you, I mean, heck, I think I, I think I stress chugged mine, so I might get another one myself. <laughs> Invite you onto my stream, leave you alone with the chat. You know, good times, good times. No, I'll take care of them. We'll go substitute <laughs> teacher mode. They'll all, like, be fucking with me, and I won't know about it. I'll be, like, doing their inside jokes and giggling. Oh, I hate to say it, they would absolutely do that. I mean, I love you all, <laughs> but you fuck with me on the regular. If I leave you with substitute teacher, uh, Mr. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. <laughs> Fucking hell. Um, and I, Lance is telling the story that needs to be told every time uh, about uh, Ultima Online whenever it gets brought up, which is mm. during the opening day ceremony when Richard Garriott, a.k.a. Lord British. And again, for those of you who don't know, Richard Garriott would attend GDC and E3, like business events, in full Renfair garb and be addressed as Lord British. That was his bit. Like... He did that, like, behind closed doors, not just as a public-facing thing. So I think he's like a mummy in his house. He's a genuine weirdo. Yeah, and, like, he is. Yeah, like, eclectic. Uh, yes. Yes. Eclectic with a lot of money to, to follow those eclectic uh, urges. <laughs> um, which is a great uh, lesson as to why I'm very happy I don't have inordinate amounts of money, but... Um, it's the opening day of Ultima Online, and he addresses the crowd at Britbank. You know, bearing in mind, like, the capital city of Ultima Online is named after his character. Okay, so Lord British stands before them, gives them a rousing speech. And during this speech, I don't know, someone pings an arrow or a fireball or something at him, and he takes damage. And the entire crowd realizes immediately that he is not invincible, and oh. they can fucking destroy him. That's so funny. But it gets better. an uprising. It gets better. Well, it wasn't even an uprising. It was just hilarious. But in Ultima Online, you can carve up a body. So you can have left arm, right arm, leg, torso, and head. So mm -hmm. someone ran away from this, like, vicious, gory pinata of hilarity holding Lord British's head. And the thing That's is, I think good. about this all the time because rather than roll with it, rather than go yes and, for possibly one of the best story hooks, he had a complete, like, um, like diva throw hands in the air mode, reset right. all the worlds, and tried to do it again, but with his invincibility on. Man, imagine how... Yeah, no, you're right. That would have been so good if, like, they, they just implement, like, a bounty system, right? And it's like, everybody go kill the guy who took Lord Garriott's head. Yeah, well, the right? idea... There's, there's a bounty for bringing it back or something. And, the like, creator was narrative. immediately murdered. Like, that's... Like, fucking Warcraft's been trying to do shit like that for a thousand years. Oh, that's so fun. Man, <laughs> I wish I could have seen that. I, I, wish I, I wish I could have done it. I'll also say, but I didn't get into Ultima Online until way later. Yeah. Uh, that's a, that's uh, I played, a story. I played uh, WoW in college and then I quit before Burn Crusade even came out. So I feel like I'm lucky on that front. Smart. Uh, my my World of Warcraft um, habit lasted for quite some time. Mm. Uh, I still feel the need to yell for the Horde whenever I see just that, that iconic symbol. Yes, I was a Horde player, too. Um, uh, yeah, speaking of, like, weird ephemeral internet stuff that's, like, lost forever, previous versions of WoW, but even more specifically, the old WoW cancellation page. Yeah. So, like, I, I was in college or whatever, so I would just, like, straight up run out of money, then I'd have to call up WoW. And I think the, for a while, the only way to cancel your sub when I was playing was to actually call up, like, a, a helpline at Blizzard. Um and talk to a human being and say, I'm, I'm, I'm out of money, cancel my WoW subscription. <laughs> I'm out, go get me out. Yeah. Uh, but they made you look at a little JPEG that said like, you are making the orc sad. Oh, fuck yeah. Remember that? Which, oh God, not to keep referencing uh, other people in the industry, but um, we had uh, Dan Olsen on the show a little while back. Mm -hmm. um, and mostly to talk about like the paratext in games, but it's hard to talk about World of Warcraft without talking about how much 
happened and is lost. Like, all the whole Ghost Crawler saga, you know, which isn't part of the game, but like, um, for those who don't know, Ghost Crawler was a very uh, vocal moderator on the forums. So much so that his style of communication became iconic. He became a kind of like a character, but slightly removed from the world. And there's no record of that. There's probably a wiki page, but like, I don't know. It definitely falls under the, I don't say what we left behind, but that's that came, same kind of idea of like, as it morphs and changes, we, we lose these temporal moments. I, but like like you were saying like a few minutes ago, it is cool that like a lot of people who are making videos about games are starting to focus a lot on that, those moments and stuff, right? Mm. Preserving that stuff. Like Matt McMuscles doing his What Happened videos where he actually interviews people and figures out why uh, somebody thought it was a good idea to do, do the Sin to Win campaign, right? And like... Yeah. Um, it's And it, like it, there's even like more like micro stuff, right? Like a lot of i see people doing like recaps of like forum famous forum dramas and oh, yeah. uh, neopets neopets kerfuffles and stuff yeah shout out um, to um people make games like oh uh, yeah ratters <sighs> no and yeah it's one of the things that's wonderful about the the space that we're in is that like because there's that hunger and because we have these systems in place now like someone can do that full time and i mm -hmm. i do love that it's real cool uh, at this point do you consider yourself a more of a are, are you a content creator or are you a game dev at this point which one do you um i often do when when doing my fanciful introductions i often say like you know i stream full-time I, I was in the games industry for 10 years whether i am or am not is uh, up for debate because like mm -hmm. i do still go to gdc right yeah. now i'm not doing anything i don't do any biz dev i don't do anything specific but i also do consult for games companies yeah. and for indie cool. devs and things like that so like am i do i yeah i'm, I'm seeing reports in the chat that you're a turnip gamer Oh no! How do you respond to these these claims? All right, so so I've had a year. I've had a year. Um, I made a little, just a little video, just a little video, and I politely recommended to people, specifically people who have kids or have been in the games industry for a long time, might be older, that maybe don't stream or do coverage on Hogwarts Legacy mm -hmm. because there are these issues about it that you might not know. Um, I did not expect it was go as viral as it went, um, to the point where, was it, the Daily Mail called me US Gamer. Oh, no. Yeah. Okay. I was like, firstly... Well, you were a US Gamer? US Gamer, Will Overguard says, don't play Hogwarts Legacy. And I'm like, firstly, I was an industry professional for 10 years. <laughs> secondly, Wait, hang on. secondly, um... And My Britishisms are a little mixed up. Is Daily Mail the garbage one, or is it the Guardian? Which one is Daily Mail? Is the garbage? Daily, one? Daily Mail's the peak of the garbage, but Guardian's okay. not amazing, right? Uh, but the Guardian ostensibly was like a, a leftier mag, and the Daily Mail's like a tabloid. Uh, the Daily Mail's the closest to kind of like Fox News that we have. Gotcha. Okay. Um, but yeah, I got called uh, a turnip by one bloke, which was one of the few insults <laughs> that really stuck with me. <laughs> it's so funny. Yeah. Um, well, I'm sorry. First of all, I'm sorry if any of it was like stressful or bad. I'm sure oh, some of it was. But holding on to the turnip thing, like you can keep that forever. Right. It was just, I got thrown a lot of insults over a short period of time. And, you know, I've done community management. I've... I've been in the eye of the storm before, and it wasn't nearly mm -hmm. as bad as launching a game that people were mad about. Yeah. Um, but just, yeah, one guy just went, you out to turn it. And you know what? That will stay with me. <laughs> like, of all the insults, that's the one that stuck with me. I kind of want to steal that. <laughs> that. That's not like a really terrible thing to say, right? It's just like, uh, okay, good. Okay. Oh, it's so far as I know. I mean, it might be a right, yeah. haunting internet slang somewhere, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I don't really know 
okay, if I have to say on my taxis, you know, what mm -hmm. keeps me afloat is these lovely Mother Hubbards and, you know, mm -hmm. doing a show here on Twitch is what allows me to live. You know, my game dev work is intermittent and uh, prior what I was doing was helping uh, indie teams get funding. So okay, cool. using contacts from I've had for a thousand years, I'd be like, oh, hey, let me introduce you to this person, not this person. Uh, mm -hmm. I did for a while, uh, I don't have a better term for it, but it's basically bounty hunting where certain publishers would say, if you find us a game that we sign, we'll give you a chunk of cash. So not like a broker or an Ooh. agent, just a, well, a bounty hunter, really. Right, yeah. Uh, and that suited me because I find brokers and agents in that regard to be quite scummy. Mm. Because they're saying, hey, you need money. Pay me money so I can get you money. And I'm like, right. ah, that doesn't sit well with me. Um, but yeah, right now, I'm not currently working on any developed projects specifically. Um, mm -hmm. This year sucks for funding. Like, oh god, yeah, everything's just getting slashed. Yeah, it was bad last year because everyone was like battening down the hatches and like you know boarding up the windows. And this year it's like, like GG no re. Um, some uh, some teams have said they have titles signed up until 2025. It's bad. God. Yeah. So this is not the year to be trying to be a cool kid indie no. video game creator. That's a, that's a super bummer. Um, yeah, that's. Ugh. Yeah. Do you do you feel like, like the thing I hear anecdotally, is that like oh publishers are you know they're more and more banking on sure shots right like the big investment big big return sort of thing. Do you feel like that's true? Uh, everyone's going safe on their dance cards and say that. Um, mm. For the big publishers, like, they already started locking down, so that's why we've seen a mm. lot of, like, either acquisitions and sales rather than, mm -hmm. like, traditional publishing deals, uh, or, like, heavily leaning on their existing catalog and short, short shot stuff. Uh, in the indie space, uh, people just signed as many titles as they could that hit as many surefire beats as possible for the next few years so okay. rather than kind of like looking for new stuff each year this there's, right. there's still potential and wiggle room for stuff but it's very slim basically gotcha. 2021 was the year where it was like the land of milk and honey for video game money which i know is bizarre but like suddenly everyone had like a 14 gajillion percent increase in money and we're like hey you look right. like the kind of person who can make an indie game. Have a dump truck full of money. <laughs> I mean, listen, you, you got to take the money. Take the money. When they say, here's the money, take the money. Yeah. Uh, Ragnar, mm. um, no one paid me to inflict uh, aliens, colonial marines on you. I just thought it was funny. Oh, no. Were you working there for colonial marines? Uh, I was... So... I always have to be very careful of my wording because shit got okay, yes. uh, litigious. I don't want you in trouble. But yeah. I was on Total War um, in the same house that yeah. um, uh, aliens, uh, Alien Isolation was being made in. Right. So, cool. yeah. I love, first of all, I love Alien Isolation. I played it for the first time a couple of months ago. It was, it was just unbelievably good and also total war i'm super excited for chorfs uh today they're out today demon mechs uh, who doesn't want that it's so cool I, I i got super uh i've started to become warhammer pilled uh over the course of the, the pandemic like ever since i was a kid it was always like the thing where i'd like go into stores and i'd see sometimes i'd go to hobby stores and I'd see the, the little mini figs and stuff and i was like i can i'm not gonna I, my parents are not gonna give me 15 dollars to buy a space marine or whatever so I've been like super aware of it for my entire life. Uh, and this year I, I bought a gaming PC or I built a gaming PC. And now it's like, oh my God, I can play a hundred Warhammer games and maybe 5% of them are good. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, but yeah. Um, I will say, uh, cause I wasn't directly on Total War Warhammer. Um, right. That's why Favor Sick keeps saying Total Warhammer because our brand managers drilled that out of it really yeah. okay that's funny because that's what all me and my friends call it yeah well that's what everyone <laughs> wants to call it because it fits but it's like 
the brand manager's like, no, no, no. Total War is one brand. Warhammer is another. We're not mashing yeah. them together. So it's one of those ticks that you can't stop doing. Yeah. Um, Makes sense. But yeah, I didn't work at it directly. I was on um, Rome 2, Attila, and the historical side. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I sat next to the peeps that did. And, yeah. God... Uh, so far, Vampire um, Counts has been my favourite, and I think the Dwarves might be able to overturn that with, like, Artillery Train, and again, mechs powered by demons. It's really yeah. hard not to like that. A murder Train. Yeah. I, I, I play, um... I, I, I have, um... I think I have all the, the factions. I need to check on Dwarves. But like, so I've just been like little by little checking in on them. Um, but I think so far, Skaven clicked with me right away because they're like rats with like World War One like Gatling guns and shit. Oh yeah. Uh, and and then nukes and nukes. Nukes, yes, Ikat Claws nukes <laughs> are so fun. And then um, what was the other one? Oh, I've been having a ton of fun with. Uh... Uh, sorry, oh, Bracken, I, I was just, just saying uh, thank you for black and white. I only did. The tiniest sliver, and specifically on creature isles. Uh, I, I'm pogging for black and white. I uh, Lionhead used to let uh, kids and green beans sign up to do a week's beta testing, and I did a bunch of that. And then I got invited to work there over the summer on creature isles. So that was technically my first video game wow. credit. That's uh, super cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Actually, uh, I met the person who I was inflicted on at GDC this year again, and it was it was lovely. Um, okay, I love telling this story, so okay. I'm basically going to abuse my power as host to retell this. This is this is purely self indulgent. So, friends, picture the scene: you are a video game producer working for a named creative, Peter Amolineux. You are trying to juggle multiple projects because at that time, you know, Lionhead Studios was making Black and White and other things, plus uh, Big Blue Box were making Fable. So that was still off-site Orbital. That's before it got brought in-house. Things are probably very stressful because there isn't like a, a standard template for running an indie studio back then, you know? But you've got a handle on this. You're a solid producer. You know what's up. And you come into work on a Monday morning and your boss goes, Hey, so I know you're doing lots of work on all these things, but we need you to babysit this overly enthusiastic, jumped up uh, teenager uh, alongside your work. We've told him he's going to be working here for the summer. Enjoy! <laughs> I, I was the hand grenade thrown on somebody else's plate. And looking back on it now, the fact that that person didn't either drown me or just leave me in the woods, I think, was an act of patience that I will never know the like of again. I think what that means is eventually you need to pay that forward. You need to suffer at the hands of a, a younger, more <laughs> evil game dev than yourself. Oh, God. For I'm penance. Sure we, I'm sure we could work something out. Um... So, Patrick, I know this has been super disjointed. Uh, do you need a, a water, a coffee, a tea or anything before we get started? All set, thanks. If, if, if you want to go get your coffee, you can, though. I would love that. <laughs> yeah, go for it. I'm going to sit here and sip, and I'll, I'll talk about Warhammer with uh, Mr. Square Peg. I'm also very excited for, for Bolt Gun. Um, and yes, Lance Icarus, I feel like every, like, three or four streams I do, I, I, I stream a bit on the side. Too. but like every three or four streams i end up having to explain the orc psychic gestalt again um because it's just literally one of my favorite things to explain to people is that that the secret is real for for orcs and magical thinking actually works i love them so much sip Absolutely. I, I I want to like uh, Warhammer Fantasy orcs a little bit more, but they haven't super clicked with me. I, I love the Warhammer Fantasy goblins. I think the one of my favorite armies that I've played so far is the, the green skin army that is specifically like really goblin oriented. Um, 
They're not quite as spicy as the 40k orcs, like lore-wise for me, but they are still really fun. Yes, that's right. Yeah, j Post, I think there's a line in one of the Warhammer novels where, like, uh, one of the Aldari? Like, like one of the, the, like, space elves is, like, giving this huge monologue about all of their incredible accomplishments and how that orcs are the only people who are happy in the universe no matter what everybody else has achieved. Um... Right, yeah, they're mushrooms. Are, are they mushrooms in fantasy and 40k? 40k 10th edition. <laughs> Square peg, if that's a tabletop game, unfortunately, I probably won't even be able to play it. I, I don't own any minis, and having space to play minis um, won't be a thing for me until I can leave New York City, where space is very tiny. Yeah, they're, Lance. They're they're um, they they reproduce with spores. Um, like my stuff. Yeah, uh, shoot is blood and teeth is okay. It's fun. It it honestly reminds me of like old flash games, like if you played um, madness combat or something like that. Right? It's like because it's like mouse control for for the stick. So you're doing you're doing platforming with one hand, then if you're using mouse and keyboard, you're actually like manually aiming around. And the weapons are fun and like the the art design is really cute and like if you're into Warhammer lore, there's like a ton of silly little easter eggs in there. The music also rips. It's like the music is all like a uh, new wave British heavy metal stuff. Um it's very fun to listen to. Yeah, Lance, like, I, I, at this point, I don't even, I know that they have, like, a whole, like, archive system, right? They have the Black Library, and I'm sure that there's somebody's job who, at Games Workshop, you know, and they got to keep track of all the, uh, all that lore stuff. But at this point, I think, like, it's got to conflict itself, right? Like, it's got, so many people have handled that license over, what, 30 years, more, that, uh, that like it's it just seems impossible that it is both uh thematically and like factually uh consistent across all that stuff um. barbell says they wildly and proudly break previous canon I still, like, I, I am not an expert in Warhammer lore by any means. I'm, like, pretty new to it. And most of what I know is just, like, me browsing Warhammer wikis and opening up, like, fucking 40 tabs and then uh, reading those until I get tired. But I still think that that uh, the Emperor should be Xenos at the end. I think they should discover that he he, he ain't from around here. <laughs> not, he's not from these parts. What's up? I have returned, coffee in hand. Nice. Uh, the, the dogs are very perturbed that they're not getting uh, all of the uh, attention. Uh, and Favor Six is correct that Aiden is probably the closest to the green beam we've had, but he did very well at GDC. Uh, <laughs> Col Reigns. Oh. So, Col Reigns, greetings. Uh, also, and I say this with love and respect, um, fuck you very much. Um. As Colrain says, happy Homestuck Day. Remember, Vriska did nothing wrong. <sighs> I'm going to hang up this call if you attempt to explain that to me. <laughs> you know what? You're, you're good. I will Reactor say this. Online. Sensors oh. online. Weapons online. All systems nominal. Thank you, Lizzie. <laughs> I cast inflict emotions on you. Which is incredibly overpowered, but thank you. Um, I am someone who read all of original Homestuck. Wow. Yeah. How, I mean, is that, that's like one piece length, right? It's like thousands and thousands of chapters. Yep. Um, I uh, will say though, a lot of it's been lost because of like the death of Flash and things like that. I right. will say that, and I actually pitched this as a GDC team <laughs> once, um, that it is unhinged nonsense. Um, but from a game development perspective, it shows just how far away we are from being able to do everything in a game. It's the only thing mm. that I'd say on it. Hmm. 
Yeah, Lance, I really all. I survived. Uh, and Keldra, thank you kindly. We didn't have cake yesterday. We had barn me. Ooh, uh, and nice. Electric J says there's an archive for it. The original Flash games. Okay. Um, oh, sweet. Because, well, it's, it's definitely something best experienced in a void. Separate mm. from... Uh, how to phrase it? Uh, separate from... Uh, community opinion. Um, sure. One thing that was fascinating is that its original format was a parody of point-and-click adventures. And then at the end of chapter one, you actually play a point-and-click adventure of the area that you've been reading about. Like, that that was the bit where it really kind of flexed on me. Was it kind of like an ARG too? Or was it all just like in... You know, clearly, like, you, you never had to, like, hunt for resources outside of the website to understand the story or anything? Um, they, move, um, they moved away from that as the project went on. Because originally mm -hmm. the pitch was much like with Problem Sleuth, was that the audience would suggest the next thing that the characters would do. Yeah. Uh, and that did lead to some ARG elements, but then Homestuck exploded in popularity and it was lost. Um, so, yeah. I wouldn't say one should read it, but there's still interesting things that it does from a... Oh, cool, apparently the world's loudest car. Love it. It's just going to be one of those days. Um, but yes, it is It is something that still has some, some weight and some value to it. Um, uh, and last, but by no means least, I should tell people that we are live on... Uh, whilst it still exists on Twitter. Hmm... So bear with me just a second, and yep, then we'll no do problem. proper introductions, yeah. and we'll get this party we'll get this party started. Yeah, get my uh, ambient tunes going again. I love bees. Ragnar, was that the Halo one? What's Ragnar going? To? Oh yes, I love bees. Well, uh, I. It feels like sometimes when you stream a lot that you get going around to the same stories. And mm -hmm. one of mine is I've been lucky enough to talk to uh, a team called Alison Smith, who are the premier like ARG for hire company in the world, um, who also have made two incredible games with... like The first one, The Black Watchman, is basically an ARG with a rapper. Um, that one was famous for when it was active, Pending psych evaluation, if you got to top tier play, you would be invited to events. They would fly you out for specific events. Pending a psych eval. Um, and uh, the Night Team 4 is like a spiritual successor to Uplink with more of a modern spin that mm -hmm. enters into a, like a weird almost MMO ARG once you get into top tier of it. Um, they're also the ones that did the uh, Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines reveal. Hello, Amos. I know, you have strong opinions on ARGs, mate. <laughs> Get you a dog that uh, wants to talk about ARGs. Um, sorry, so yeah, I, I love talking about ARG stuff. It's fucking wild. I've never done one. Like I've I've never um participated in one. I rem the first one I remember is maybe not the first one I remember, but I remember the first one that was like super big on my radar was I think there was one for the Dark Knight, um, the the second Batman Nolan Batman movie. Um, I don't remember any details about it. <laughs> uh, you know what was really cool though, like pre ARG was the Matrix website, enterthematrix.com. Yes. Like they, would, they would have like just stuff on there. I like, spent days downloading the um like the first half of the Animatrix because they'd let you if you yep. played with the whole not really ARG, it was like a site game, but yeah. Right. If you did all the things you could download like the history of man part one and two and right. the the samurai um ninja test one fuck i forget what it's yes. called there was there was yeah there's there was the samurai one and then there's the, yeah there's the one where that, that i feel like is the worst one in the animatrix but like that like proto photorealistic square uh 
like 3D animated one where like oh, yeah. some people fighting in the dojo and one of them like cuts the other one's pants off and it's weird and horny. Yeah, uh, that one was and then a there's the one. Then there's the really cool like uh, ninja rooftop battle one. Which was ridiculous. Anyways. Uh... Okay. Sorry, I've nearly banged us out a tweet as well. And again, like everybody, thank you for bearing with me today, especially Patrick, especially yourself. No problem. Um, everything that could have broken broke this morning whilst trying to get this working, um, which we think was a. We now think as a Windows update that kind of balked everything. So we're in like a Google meeting call at the moment to make this all work. It's oh, it's been a glorious mess. You know what? Let's go for a Tekken GIF. Um, yes. Dude, watching... Sorry, I'm going to just be a little bit of a fan sure. for a second. Watching your video about getting into fighting games proper was such a wonderful thing. Um, I got to experience that when I was working at Sega QA, which is what got me mm -hmm. into Tekken, because oh. we had very limited lunch breaks, so that's what we played. Right. Yeah, thank you. No, that that is probably one of my favorite videos that I've worked on because of how practical it is, <laughs> uh, and how, yeah, it's it's something that I, I would want myself if it didn't exist. So we made it, or I, something I would have wanted um, when I was getting into it. <clears throat> yeah, I think we'll get King doing some flexing. Yeah. It's slightly oh. unrelated, but he does suplex, so. He does suplex. He loves to do that. Yeah, he knows a lot of them. He's got like 12 different suplexes. <laughs> um. Okay, friends, the deed is done. A tweet has been deployed, coffee has been poured. I think we're ready to actually pretend like we know what we're doing. Um, although I've been enjoying this kind of, this is this has been fun. Yeah, I, I, honestly, I don't have much frame of reference. I'm like, oh, this is just what we do. That's fine. <laughs> uh, I would be totally okay with that. Well, I try, I try and have some structure. Um, yeah, I have been very lucky that throughout my career, I've got to meet a lot of very cool people, and mm -hmm. I've realized that that gives me a buttload of knowledge that other people wouldn't have access to. So I try and bring cool people on the show to like deconstruct stuff and talk about stuff because that way I'm I'm sharing that that knowledge, you know? Nice. And I wanted to bring you on the show to talk about truck nuts. Thank you. I've so, been waiting. I've got I've got a lot of notes on truck nuts, a lot of stuff that didn't make it into the video that I'm really excited to share. Oh shit, we um, get the B-roll truck nuts. Yep. Yep, you'll you'll get the footage of me uh, testing out all the different truck nuts and then manually photographing them so I could Photoshop them onto the the different <laughs> mechs. Um, um, and yeah, I... as soon as you said truck nuts, my guinea pigs started squeaking like the fucking <laughs> timing. Uh, okay, okay. No, I'm gonna try and be serious now. <clears throat> okay, friends, crewmates, and legends. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce you all. Polygon's Patrick Gill. Hello, uh, I'm Polygon's Patrick Gill. Sorry, I, I didn't keep going, keep going. Um, for those who do not know, uh, Patrick is part of uh, Polygon's video team and has done some exceptional works, which we're gonna be chipping away at today. Uh, a lot of them are some really incredible breakdowns uh, on video games into a depth and detail that few haven't. I was, Lizzie, I was gonna. Quitter. I've been getting Lizzie Happy. to remind me to ask people their pronouns when they're guests on Thank the Thank you, show. Lizzie. <laughs> um, and while I have been joking about bringing you on here specifically to talk about truck nuts, um, one of your videos, uh, which was about the character design, or I should say the mechanical design in Anthem, is probably one of the best examples of understanding why we've been feeling a lot of banality from the AAA space and what it is that attracts us to certain concepts and designs. It's honestly one of the best in show for understanding that. And so I really wanted to bring you on the show and talk about that. That's really nice to hear. Thank you. No, I, I genuinely reference it a lot. And 
it's been a really good case study for, for example, we were talking about the new bad guys from Halo Infinite mm -hmm. and how they lack personality. And they absolutely have the lack of truck nuts problem. Now, <laughs> before to give you all a primer if you didn't watch the video, the TLDR is that when it Stop comes to incessant clicking. Thank you, Lizzie. Oh, thanks, Lizzie. Um, when it comes to uh, AAA design, is that there is a habit of specific designs to be, well, over-designed. They're too perfect. They lack flaws, they lack uh, a sense of identity. And you put forward the case that the big chunky mech should have truck nuts. Yeah. Uh, that was a, like a... It, it never really turned into a full series of videos, but it, it was a sort of flavor of video that I started doing where I would like start thinking about the most a far gone conclusion I could draw from like some pet peeve that I had and then essentially back into actually justifying it by the end of the video. I think the Louis, the Muppets Bloodborne is another one and the uh, Jackie Chan Luigi video is another <laughs> one where it's just like, uh, let me just say something really stupid and then actually try to make a case for it. Um, yeah, and I, the Truck Nuts video is one of those. Um, because I remember the the marketing for that game coming out and just feeling so little and being like, how come I don't feel anything? I'm looking at robots. I love robots. <laughs> um, or mech suits or whatever. Yeah. That was a fun one, though. So, um, oh, here's a fun fact. Hang on. No, fun factoid. Exclusive. That was the second version of that video that we shot, too, because initially it was going to be part of a much stupider higher concept series that nobody was going to watch called take talks where it was just it was entirely like presented like a ted talk okay. like i was wearing like a black turtleneck and like walking around and like i had like a, a, a slideshow behind me and i was just like thumbing through it one by one and it was essentially the same content the same bullet points and we shot the whole thing and then i started editing it editing it and i was like this fucking sucks so bad <laughs> so i just reshot the script um and made it a talk like and tried to talk like a normal human being for the camera. I mean, and it fucking worked. But sorry, I kind of, I kind of talked at you with that whole pitch. That's okay. So I guess I wanted to start with. Well, okay. Like I said, we had all the uh, the chaos and nonsense earlier, so I'm kind of getting my getting my patter back. So, sure. before we go into the deep dive, um, do you want? Do you mind giving these lovely people like a little bit of your background, like you know, Patrick Gill, video game. Smith, the story so far. Yeah, sure. It's it's um a short one. I uh, I what did I do? What have I done with my life? I'm 35. <laughs> uh, I <laughs> went to grew up in the military, moving around a lot. Settled in Maine. Went to a state college uh, for new media. Um and then graduated with a bachelor's degree, worked at GameStop for a while, um, then got a job at the university that I graduated from doing literally everything a person like over 50 thinks a person under 30 should know how to do. So I did their photography and their web design and video editing and instructional design for their online classes. I did tech support for one department. Um, yeah, so literally everything. Um, Hey, we got multiple GameStop survivors in the chat. Nice. Oh, yeah. um, and, and then I... It's games retail as well, so... It, 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 you feel a camaraderie? <laughs> it's, uh, boy. Yeah, it's... We, we, we'll have a GameStop chat soon. But yeah, anyways, um, so I... I... Then I shifted to a new job at this university, and I was just mostly just doing, like, uh, video tutorials for uh, gardening and uh agriculture stuff and it was super cool right because i was like a, a a one man show and i would just like drive like four hours up into maine and like learn how to frost seed your field or how to uh prune a forsythia tree and it was it was all just learning from these experts that we had at the the university and then trying to find a way to repackage it into like video content or you know instructional content um, so I guess that was sort of practice for the stuff that I do at Polygon, where I try to like learn a lot about something, learn enough about something to say something about it. But then, yeah, in like 2016, I got a job at Polygon, um, 
and I've been there for seven years, and I have never had another job in the game industry. Oh shit! Yeah. Whoa! Fucking yo! Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, Jake, how are you doing, mate? Lovely to see you. Um. Also, I guess that leads on to my next question: is like, how in the ruddy hell do you get such an insight into titles? For, like. <sighs> For example, like the, the 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 takes that I'm delivering in videos, like the the truck nuts one. Let's I mean let's go with truck nuts because you've done some yeah. wonderful like investigative investigative stuff or things yeah. that are like a, a snapshot in time. The the COD War video is masterclass. Um, oh, thank you. But with like the Bloodborne video and specifically with the truck nuts, it's shown a level of insight that we haven't really seen other people hit. And I guess I kind of want to go through that process mm. because yeah, understanding that from the outside perspective is no mean feat. Sure. It, it, I mean, it's, it's hard for me to understand it too. I think like, I'm not used to talking this seriously about my work. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't, I, I no, it's okay. you. I'll come at Let's you. Do it. I'll give you Let's the real questions. Do it. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I think, I honestly think for me, a lot of it just comes from uh, self-awareness because um, I feel like a lot of like the best videos that I've made come from me like experiencing a discomfort or a a feeling about a thing and then trying to interrogate really hard why I feel that way about the thing um, and sort of unraveling it from there right? like sometimes you just have a feeling about a thing you're like how come this you know makes me twitch in a certain way internally and then just like laying out all the reasons it could possibly be and then finding it from there so in like the case of the truck nuts video it was like it was well how come i don't feel anything when i look at this and then with the call of duty video it was like this this growing ickiness that i felt inside me as a person who enjoys call of duty games and also as a person who is growing up and learning <laughs> more about how the world works. Um, yeah, I just, but yeah, I, I guess that's it. Like, cause, cause I don't have any, I don't have a lot of contacts inside the games. And that's the thing that I try to make sure that I try to avoid like um, assigning intentionality when I'm talking about this stuff. And I try to more focus on like results, right? Like. I never want to like, because I don't know how you make a game. I, I, I have a deep respect for making games. So I don't want to say, well, they did this because, but I can say, well, they did this and it makes me feel this way. Um, yeah. Anyways. No, no, I was just going to touch on a couple of things. Uh, one is, um, friends, if you haven't seen it, uh, Patrick's video on the Call of Duty War Circus is absolutely worth your time, uh, as it is a really good understanding of a very complicated part of our industry. Plus, you get to see the single greatest Keeley face of all time. Thank you for immortalizing that. That was actually it. No, you're right. That With that one, it was... That video was literally the catalyst for the whole thing because me and my friends were obsessed with this video um, context, for those of you who haven't seen it. It's this promotional video that um, uh, Mountain Dew shot at Call of Duty XP 2011 that is just the most garish, hilarious, like, gamer culture lampoon I've ever seen. It, the fact that it's um, not a parody blows my yeah. mind. And friends, one of the hosts gets uh, Feck and Keeley to do a shot of whatever the Mountain Dew flavor of the week is. And you can see on his face, he doesn't want to do it. This yeah. is, he's obviously been ambushed with this. And yeah. the, the presenter do, even does the hook arm shot with him. And you get to see about eight different facial reactions as he goes through the flavor of whatever it is he's had to drink, steals and, himself to then try and smile afterwards. And then this woman who's, I'm sure, she, she was just gigging it too, right? She was just doing her job. But oh, yeah. like, then she leans her head on his and the, the feeling, like the, the micro expression on his face where he's like, oh, and now you're gonna do that to me too. <laughs> it's so painful. Because <laughs> okay, but, no, no hate to those presenters. Um, if you haven't seen those kind of events, like they're pretty infrequent now. But basically, an LA 
uh, events company would just hire 40, 50 would-be actors and be like, right, today you're running Call of Duty Fest. You're on lines, you're on presenting, you're on enthusiasm, and, you know, they're they're hype for hire. So no no hate to them. But it was just getting to see Keeley, just hating them, hating life, questioning what brought him there. And then, as you said, that last bit of like, oh, oh, now you're going to just think, oh, fine. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I was obsessed with that video. I th me, me and my friend Ryan, my old roommate Ryan, uh, I think did, it was either two or three streams where we just watched that video over and over again. Then we'd like watch it on half speed. Then we'd watch it on like 0.25 speed. And we'd just go through it frame by frame. And uh, I, I think it's just inherently funny to pay too much attention to things that don't deserve it. And then what happened was I started, I genuinely gradually started to notice the things I should be paying attention to in that video. Like, wait a second, how come all these guys are wearing fresh Marine Corps t-shirts? Like somebody just gave it to him and they're like, yeah, I'll put this on. At a call of, hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I, Weird. I wholeheartedly agree. I do the same thing with Mr. Caffeine from that one Ubisoft event. Uh, yeah. Watching a man unhinge live on stage, it's it supersedes cringe. It's it's another level. Mm -hmm. um, and um... hey, uh, Jake, cheers to you. And, Jake, um, I believe if I'm not um, having a complete uh, gin-based brain breakdown, uh, Jake Tucker is also a fantastic journo. Um, oh, cool. and Hello, wrote please. an incredible article about the contents of Nathan Drake's fridge that I think about <laughs> to this day. If That's it is the good. same gentleman, and I'm not getting my brain completely destroyed, uh, he broke down the sad tragedy of Nathan Drake's life based That's on so what he has in his fridge. But that's exactly what I'm talking about, right? Is if you if you look too close at the things that aren't supposed to, to be important, you find meaning. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's something that I personally seek to do with a lot of games, but from like a like an artistic standpoint, I, I'm not I'm not as good at like taking a step back because I'm too close to it. I can't deconstruct it mm. from just the uh, an an external standpoint. I can't help but yeah. empathize with the team who made it and put it together. That's I mean, that is like that is hard for me where like I um well first of all, I don't have that inside perspective, so like I, like I said, I usually, unless I can get somebody to tell me something, I just have to talk about how I feel about something. But I do have things like cases where like, I want to say something about a game, but I'm like, I don't want to hurt somebody's, like, cause I know somebody worked on this. Yeah. Uh, and I, yeah, I was. Actually, sorry to, to derail us a little bit, but one no, thing for sure. I'd love to get your feelings on at some point uh, is Wanted Dead because I still can't work out if it's inspired genius or just mm -hmm. unhinged coincidence. Um, I, I, I need to play it. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I've, I've been watching to, some streams of it. I try not to color your views of it. It's just that I, I've i been... We played it on Tuesday and I'm still obsessed with it because I don't know if it's just they tried to botch it together as quick as possible and it just happened to be okay or if it's intentionally genius and the more i look at it the more i can't work out which i love those that's fun okay i will take a look at that like um, um one of the most notable voice actors in it who um uh, sorry one of the most notable voice actors in wanted dead is the same person who played quiet in mgs5 stephanie justin yes the irony of choosing a character to be your main person who is famous for playing a character who doesn't speak. And I have seen some clips. It seems like maybe she wasn't briefed about what was happening in any of the scenes she was in. Oh, well, that's the thing. Maybe they aren't, or they're not, but you don't... Uh, there's this weird disconnect between all the vocal performances and what happens. Yeah. But sometimes... You can't tell if it's intentional or just speed. 
Oh shit, we can get famous. Uh, oh, exciting offer here. Yeah, no, I, I had these guys in my chat the other day. Dogehype.com, oh, everybody. It's so lovely for them to stop on, but... Uh, oh, we'll look <laughs> oh, at that. no. Something must have happened with their account. Oh, damn. I'm so sorry for him. I'm sorry I didn't write that down. Um, but yeah, so the main voice performer, uh, the main vocal performer for Wanted Dead, it's their first credited role anywhere. Mm -hmm. And there's... It's... Oh, oh Amos, you're fine. Oh. Um, sorry, I don't want to derail this just talking about Wanted Dead. It's just that please give it a play because I need somebody else to work out whether or not um, it is inspired genius or uh, I don't know. Or whether it was just like cobbled together terrible that just somehow critically hit to be brilliant. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I the, the feel. Like, isn't that hard to do in in games, right? Isn't, isn't it hard to do a, a so bad it's good game? It is difficult. Um, because a lot of the time, the thing that falls apart is the actual gameplay experience. Right. And that's actually good. Uh, okay. I, I recommend playing it on Neko-chan mode, because otherwise it is impossibly brutal. Oh, yeah, I heard it's really, really, really hard. Um, yeah, I will... How much is that? Is it wanted dead. But... Okay, feck it. I mean, we're talking about it already. I went on a wild deep dive about that game, and so when I started the stream on Tuesday, I've gone full Pepe Silvia about this game and how it came to be, because it's basically the spiritual successor to Devil's Third. But... Right. But what's-his-face has left? He's making a mobile phone NFT MMO. So course, Mr. Yeah. Dead or Alive is off doing weird shit somewhere else. So it's the team that he built and got eaten by a bigger dev team that was left behind doing okay. whatever they can. And it, it's wild. It's fucking wild. It. Oh, and Laura, if you want to know the story, I'll tell you the story. <laughs> like, sorry, I invite you onto my show and I'm just talking no, at okay. you about a game. Well, not... <laughs> I'm rewatching the trailer for it now. Whoa! Um, okay, so the trailer isn't great. It just kind of focuses on the action. It's pretty generic, which is why I almost right. missed it. But going back to the uh, the person who played Quiet, they got her to do nine cooking videos set in the world of Wanted Dead. That rocks. But her character is a gunsmith. Yeah. She can cook too. <laughs> That's allowed. All right, yeah, I, I, I want to play this. I'm, all... I'm seeing some some tank mechs too, like some uh, uh, Ghost in the Shell kind of robot mech tanks thing. Okay. Oh yeah. Anyways, uh... <laughs> no, I will play this and I will uh, try to see how it makes me feel. Yeah. yeah. Because here's the thing: I'm still thinking about it and I'm still talking about it and. It reminds me more of the original Yakuza than anything else, where the team weren't quite confident in the main bits, so they just did whatever they wanted around it. Like, yeah, I, I love those Yakuza games. I, I, I played, I think, I played zero through six. Uh, well, like when the pandemic started, and like we were in like initial uh lockdown like i was like well i guess it's time to to live in camarocho so i just like went nuts on those games and they're so fantastic oh yeah um i was lucky enough that while i was sorry a story upon a story while i was working uh on total war my flatmate uh he could read japanese and his mate was uh fluent so they get the Yakuza games and sit and go through them for a weekend and explain it to me. So the newest yeah. one, the, um, the Shinsengumi one, I got to see the yes. OG version of that being played. Cool. And they explained all the references and stuff to me. It was fucking great. Yeah, that that is a video that I want to make. Uh, but I like with access, I want to make a video just about the localization of the Yakuza games. Like, because the, the work that they did in that localization is unbelievable right like i feel like so much of like like there's a huge fandom for these games right in the even in the west especially in the west but it's 
it, it's that always strikes me as interesting because it's like a fandom completely based on this translated version of it where they took liberties right and they like made subtle changes um but it's it's really cool um no, no, it's, it's absolutely exceptional okay so so jumping back jumping back hey, sorry um, no, no, no. I, I, I took us way off the beaten path. <laughs> Laura's talking about the how many times it takes to, how many slaps it takes to cook a chicken. Uh, huh. We're on uh, Majima's a National Treasure. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Oh shit, Mark Hamill did his voice in Yakuza 1? What? Yeah, apparently somebody asked him about it recently and he doesn't remember. <laughs> 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 Which makes sense, right? Like you, you show up for a video game voice acting gig and you're there for like eight hours, and then you're gone. <laughs> yep. Um, um, I was a big fan of the uh, the Way of the Samurai series, and I'm still hoping mm, to get more of those. Those were good. I think I only played two of those, but those are really great. Um, but okay, so so jumping back, jumping back. Like primarily, your video content is about those sorts of deep dives, and like. trying to think how to phrase it because i already asked like your your process um, sure i mean i can talk more about that because I, I, I give you a very vague answer <laughs> i just keep getting Do distracted by good banter um, no it's okay let's get into the weeds let's get let's yeah. get sticky with it yeah i mean so like i said it usually starts with a feeling it's so vague. <laughs> it starts with a feeling i sound like such a fucking prick no like <laughs> Uh, but no, it, it's just like, it's about like recognizing when I have a feeling about something, enough feeling to talk about it because like I'm part of my brain is like constantly doubting whether or not I have anything worth saying, right? Like, and I, if I, but my job is to keep coming up with things to say. <laughs> <laughs> so I just have to like be really good at like auditing when I feel strongly enough about something to actually talk about it. Um, and then once I do that, it's a matter of like sitting down with my coworkers, uh, like Simone or, you know, um, Clayton or whatever, and then just like bouncing stuff off of them, um, until I feel like I have at least an inkling of an idea of how I'm going to put the, the story together. And then it's just writing and discovery and watching tons of videos on YouTube and going down rabbit holes and, um, eventually coming up with a script and then putting that script again in front of people and reading it with them and, you know, trying to make sure that they understand, um, uh, understand where I'm coming from. And I'm not just like, cause like I'm, I'm fresh out of this, like YouTube, Wikipedia, uh, internet, old GameSpot article rabbit hole right and I, I've forgotten which way is up and now I need to talk to somebody else to make sure that like I'm not leaving out some huge detail in this thing that I just accept as common knowledge uh but yeah and that's it um well, so Laura had a good question like basically off the back of that one which is uh, do you ever get trapped in that feeling like you have to validate opinions you have that aren't related to the work as Laura finds that they do that a lot that so like can you give me an example um if you, if you don't mind, like in terms of, and wh while you are giving me a, a, an example so I can answer that, I'll say that one thing that I do, one trap that it's really hard not to fall into, or a balance that's really hard to find when you're doing YouTube videos specifically is like, um, how far down the route of countering counter arguments do you want to go or the predicted counter arguments that you're going to get right the but actually is okay that you're going to get when you're writing a script um so to like let me try to think of an example like and that, that, that honestly that is a huge part of our editing process when we're sitting down and table reading together is hitting each other with those theoretical but actually is mm. where it's like um well you're saying this, but a person could interpret it this way, or actually there is a game where this happens. This thing that you say only happens in this certain series happens. So I'm going to hit you with that now so that we can sure up this ship. Um, hang on. Uh, Stringer says, you back up like research. Why do I feel a way about a game? Like, wow, I'm not sure I dig this, trying to figure out whether it's just you. Yeah, I... Stringer, yeah, I, I think that that happens I, I think i am blessed to to work at a um 
the publication where like I'm allowed to address that, right? Like in the text itself. Like I don't need to like I'm not like a necessarily a game reviewer, right? Where um Sorry, uh, it's Amos in the background. That's fine. He's just decided. That's fine. Um, actually, a very good example of that was the video you did about uh, Chivalry 2. Which right. Was a, which was essentially about how it evoked a feeling. Like, that was the content you put forth. Right. Yeah, I was, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to shut you down, Stringer. No, what, what I meant more is that, like, I when I do my stuff, like, if I have those feelings, right, I'm able to just integrate that back into the script, right? Like, if I'm like, hey, I'm not sure if this is just me, uh, but, uh, and I can say that in the script, I'm not like rendering judgment on the game in a way where somebody's going to be like, you judged us unfairly because just about everything in one of the videos we make is sort of comes with a, um, mm. an inherent, uh, here is my interpretation of this. Um, uh, and just electric Jace was adding that, uh, uh, definitely understand the process of script writing and counter counter argument considerations and nuts to grapple with before it's got even gotten into production yeah and uh, then the hard thing is like when you um had someone be like kid we literally don't care you can just feel yeah you should feel a way you should feel a way and write about it um but yeah like uh one of the funny things that happens sometimes when we're script writing is like we will have the counter arguments um and then sometimes we'll be like well this script can only be so fucking long right so we can't plug every single hole in this boat otherwise this boat is going to be just like nothing but plugs and it's going to sink to the bottom of the sea oh, and so it is you've so... also played uh, sea of thieves <laughs> yes and it is so funny and frustrating though when we do that and then in the okay. youtube comments we see one of the people pointing out the thing that like we we decided does not matter for the, the story that we're trying to tell. And it's like, no, I know, we know, we know, but we don't have room. Oh, that is a beautiful puppy. Yeah, oh my god. This is the wee baby Amos. Oh, Amos. We love Amos. We do. He's a he's a lot, but we love him. Um That's a good point, fearless son. Um Yeah. No, no, um, no. It's, well, I haven't done like long form video essay stuff uh, apart from a couple of times. And honestly, the video editor I was working with just went, look, just roll the audio and just talk and I'll cut it together. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't have a lot of experience in it. And like when you're breaking things down on stream, you can take two hours to like follow a thread right. early. And if someone goes, well, actually, uh, if you're not being an arse about it, you can be like, oh shit, I didn't know that. Okay, well that changes right. on looking at it. It's one of the things right. that I really enjoy about this. Yeah, it's it's really fun. Um... Fuck up, Sadlin. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, back when uh, Hot Pepper Gaming was still a thing, I did that. Um, and I severely underestimated what I was going to have to do. Uh, I had stringers busting out the really good comments. Um, yes. Laura Zoskin, uh, they would like to know, reading the comments, how do you not just throw yourself in a well when it's a bad day for a video? Um, well, again, this is a, another place where I'm very lucky, which is that I don't, I don't have to. <laughs> I don't have to read the comments. Um, we, we, uh, we, Simone handles most of that because she loves it. She lives in that space. Uh, and I get very, 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 very self-conscious being perceived <laughs> uh, or, you know, critiqued, uh, which is it's actually good, though, because sometimes people raise really good points. And I'm like, yeah, OK, that's a very good point. Um, but I think generally I I just don't go unless I'm feeling very fortuitous on a given day. If I if I check in on myself and I'm like, you know, what? I'm ready to hear what people have to say about my ideas. I'll go in there and I'll look. But if I'm on a day where like I don't have that internal fortitude i'll be like i'm i'm not gonna look at a computer gotta get you the voice uh, you gotta get you the voice uh i was taught this very early on because as a community manager you don't have the option of not looking you are you know yeah. you are the watcher on the wall you are the sword in the dark 
Um, so my friend taught me a tip that has kept my sanity for years, which is you read it in the dumbest, stupidest voice you can. <laughs> Hello, my name is Crunt Blonick 420 and I think that your face is dumb and stupid and that you don't know what video games are. And you read them all like that, and then you're fine. <laughs> I do like that. That's good. And if anyone says oh. anything nice, you read it in your voice. It's great. Yeah, there we go. Let, let's dehumanize our critics. Great advice. Okay, I'm writing this down, Will Overgaard. Dehumanize your critics. Okay. <laughs> um, they know no, what uh, they did. Uh. <laughs> I, I really like Sadlin, or sorry, Sadlin's question because that is so hard. Uh, sorry, specifically like watching somebody like stream one of your videos, it like, it is the most exposed I have ever felt like watching somebody watch one of my videos. It's also good in some cases, like if, if the person is like doing it in like good faith. Oh, sorry to interrupt, but yeah, yeah, uh, sorry. just for everybody watching. So sorry, uh, yeah. Maximilius Dude is a very prolific streamer in the fighting game space uh, who doesn't understand how IPs work, but um, <laughs> Look, I love his enthusiasm for Marvel vs. Capcom 2, but he doesn't get... He doesn't get it! It's a nightmare! Anyway, um, he played one of your videos. I believe it was the... Um, uh, the how to get into professional... Uh, no, how to get into fighting games. Yeah. Um, and he played that live on stream. Now, friends, Maximilius Dude's audience is measured in the thousands. Mm. So... There's Sorry. a lot of them. Yeah, so just yeah. to give it prime, it wasn't like some blokes down the corner were just watching your YouTube video on a four-person stream. Like, it's right. a big deal. Yeah, in, in that case, I was really happy. Uh, that I, I was very happy that it happened. Watching it, I did, first of all, I didn't watch it live. I didn't look at the chat uh, until I started, again, until I had the fortitude. Uh, but, like, that's really... It's hard, but it's also really good. So just like in fighting games, uh, watching your tape back, right? Like watching your matches back makes you feel so exposed because you see every single little mistake that you made and everything that maybe anything you could have tweaked or done differently. And so like the result is a lot of times you just won't look at your footage, right? Mm. Um, and But then you don't see those holes and then you can't start learning to plug them. But I feel like watching like him watch my videos, uh, Sejam, who's another fighting game guy, did a watch along of it too, made me realize like, it, it, it helped me reground me and like, oh shit, no, people watch these videos. There is a human being watching these videos. So like every little joke that doesn't land or any time that like I um, just like do something stylistically that I'm like, that didn't help propel this forward. This was a waste of Maximilian's time to watch this five seconds of this video. Like that's helpful. And that's like, like several times over the last few months when I'd be like writing something, I'll write something that like feels like it's not quite in my voice or feels like I'm just, yeah, like, like, like it doesn't feel right. I'll write something where I imagine somebody watching me deliver it in a video and I'll be like, no, I don't want to watch somebody watch me deliver this line in a video. So I'll rewrite it. <laughs> so that's been helpful. But anyways, yeah, um, that, that was super cool. I think his watch along of my video has more views than my video, <laughs> but that's okay. Because Oi. I think Sorry. My, I think my video will keep accruing views over time and continue being useful to people. Um, but in that case, it was like super validating because like I watched a lot of Max and I watched a lot of Say Jam and I watched, you know, I feel like I did it very respectfully and uh, I think Part of it was like the ego, the, the the slight ego stroke that these people got to see this person who's making this video about entering this new space. And then in the video, when I'm talking about like the people who you should be paying attention to and stuff in the space, they're seeing themselves there. So it's like that it's easy to get on their side there. Wow, that's um, super cool. And I guess this kind of comes back to something I wanted to ask you, which was how is it like knowing that you are creating things that do have an impact and an influence on the space you're commenting on? Like, yo, Does it? if you want to actually, if you want to take a beat, um, Laura, when you said the pink head beast keeps talking too much chatter, I imagined you basically having this like bloodborne transmogrification of kind of like Vicar Amelia, but with like a, like pink streaks. That was what I thought there. Sorry, I just needed to share that with. I like that. 
Um, because, like, I can only talk in the micro. Like, I'm not mm -hmm. based in a major studio, and often it's hard to see the impact. But knowing the impact of something like um, the Sequelitis videos, mm -hmm. you know, work like yours does get shared. I mean, we've discussed it here um, with, you know, new and budding creatives or with like you know indie devs with no resources um and this is why we keep coming back to the truck nuts video because it's so applicable like how does it is that something that you've considered that you might be creating stuff that influences the the very thing you're commenting on mm. i don't know i i, I... It's, it's kind of a closed loop for like like just like personally speaking it, it, it's kind of a closed loop because i don't have I have one friend who's a game dev, but I've known him since I was, you know, for like 10 years, um, since we were in college. Uh, he doesn't watch my stuff. Uh, <laughs> so like, I don't see where those loops happen. I gen, and again, I don't have great self-esteem, so I generally feel like uh, the stuff that I'm making, its purpose is less to drive like change or um, to, to be like a resource, like you're saying, and more to, it's edutainment right it's like let me get i know that there's a ton of people out in the world who like really care about games enough that they want to hear people talk about games and what i like is to hear people talk about games and then occasionally tell me something that i didn't know and i can be like oh cool right so that's like that's it for me um but it, i mean it would be cool like to know that i guess it would be validating to know that like i'm not just talking out of my ass um when i say stuff yeah, that would be nice. No, and um, it absolutely is the case. Um, again, friends, I've been recommending it to you a thousand times if you hadn't seen it. Um, Patrick did a video based on the mecha design of Anthem, and that while the mechs were incredibly well crafted, they lacked personality. And whilst the ultimate uh, outcome was fucking funny as all hell, you know, give one guy four swords and a giraffe neck and ultimately give the heavy truck nuts. It did highlight the fact that you cannot just design something perfectly in a vacuum and expect it to have that that cool factor. Um, that you have yeah. to consider the, the faults and the flaws of your characters, uh, or your character design, I should say. Yeah. I think a lot of like, you're, you're asking earlier, like how I got like insight for that kind of stuff where that comes from i still don't have a good answer but i just know that like it is partially just like um being a young media obsessive and right that there are so many of us now there are so many people now who like really really love things and then start wanting to understand how to deconstruct the things that they love so that they can enjoy them more um or so that they can appreciate them more and i think that's just i'm just one of those people i guess where that was me and then i guess i sometimes am right <laughs> even though i've never done the thing that i love uh or that i'm obsessed with uh, uh. <laughs> i like these questions yeah uh, pick some pick some bangers uh what's a game related subject that you want to talk about but you haven't done a video because it wouldn't make for a good video so for a long time it was that mountain dew video it's like literally my first day I came in, I was like, y'all need to watch this video. I need, I'm finally among people who will care about this video. And nobody cared. <laughs> um, <laughs> so then uh, I just kept watching it over and over. And then like, so yeah, and I, I read books and I had other life experiences where finally that video that I was just obsessed with because I thought it was funny, the Mountain Dew Call of Duty promo video was something that I could actually use as the root for something meaningful. Um, so that was that for a long time. Let me think. Uh, something that I wanted to do, but I haven't done. Going into the vault. Going into the vault. I don't know. Actually, I don't know. <laughs> I'll think about that one. Um, well, whilst one of those are coming on, uh, another one that I wanted to, um, I guess this is more a process question than anything else, is that yeah. how do you make incredibly fucking dry industry topics entertaining? Um, if we're going to pick an example, the first 15 seconds of a game video, 
Mm. No one, and I say this with love and respect, even the people who work at Wise are as enthusiastic about Wise as, as you make it seem. <laughs> um, oh, actually, and as a side note to that, um, feck you, because I spent the entire time going around GDC, every time I saw them going, Wise were Wise. 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 <laughs> Sorry, please um, continue. No, that's good. Uh, Always! We're trying to... <laughs> this is my life. That's okay. Be a professional I, yeah. streamer, they said. It'd be easy. Puppies! I need to get some puppies. <laughs> I want puppies. Um, yeah, like the, the, the first 15 seconds one, I think, was just... Again, it was a moment where I felt something, and it was I was looking at the the, um, the logo for Oodle. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I don't know if you have the capability of putting this up on your screen, but the logo for Oodle. Uh, every time I'd see it, I was like, "Why is this in so many games, and why does it look so bad?" Uh, so then that put me down the the path of like thinking about all those other like um, things that I was aware were. Um, like middleware logos that you see when you boot up a game and then being like, well, I've never really thought about what each of these does. Um, uh, sadly, friends, I can't bring up the Oodle uh, logo okay. right now. Um, okay. But uh, do look it up because for something that is an absolute cornerstone, especially in the AAA spaces, the fact that they have the most cursed logo is amazing. Um, exactly, Ragnar, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um no, it was is a really it's it's a hilariously bad logo. But then I was like, ah, oh, I I want to talk. It was honestly it was also an easy hit for me, right? Because like a lot of times, um, like we just have to make we have to make videos, and sometimes doing a video like the Call of Duty one yeah. is, or even the fighting game one, it's Thank it's like emotionally that. exhausting. Thank you. In addition to the, the the amount of like research and stuff, it is it, it can be emotionally very very tiring. Like the the Call of Duty one like took a lot of stuff out of me. Um, oh yeah. So then I was just like, I can just Sorry, look I'm up okay. what <laughs> a bunch continue. of programs do, and then explain it in a fun way. Still and then I've finished the video, and I've enriched somebody's life because now they know why that octopus is in the first fifteen seconds of their game. Air Dragon, right? Yeah, that was somebody like found. I think that's the one where like somebody found just like a, a, a stock stock graphic design website that had that same logo on it and they're like Sorry Hello. No, that's um, okay. Now, did you I actually I thought this would be an interesting one. I, I might tweak it slightly, but um articulating yes. up what Ragnar was asking, is there a video you keep having requested of you that you absolutely do not want to do? Um, so it, this isn't one of like my ant analysis videos, but I, I worked on uh, Unraveled with my coworker Brian David Gilbert. We co-wrote a lot of that stuff, and like um, BDG, would, BDG. I would story edit a lot of that stuff as well. Um, and people really, 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 really wanted an episode about the concept of Pokemon edibility, um, which Pokemon aren't and aren't edible. And I think our vibe was like it's it's too memey and it's. It's already, yeah. It's not enough of a joke, or it's it's not. It's our it, it's already too much of a joke for us to make a joke out of it. Mm. And then I think eventually we did it, and it wasn't a, <laughs> it wasn't our best. Um, but I don't I don't even remember if I helped on that one. Anyways, all Pokemon are edible. That's right. All right. Um, I... But in terms of like, go ahead. Sorry. No, just I think it needs reference because it is an iconic moment uh, and one that gets referenced a lot. To those who were able to see it, the full poker rap. Oh yeah. How much involvement did you have in that one? Um, so I, all the parts that were genius and beautiful were Brian, and all the parts that <laughs> were, uh, were mechanical and um, necessary were me. <laughs> no, uh, no, it, it was it wasn't that even of a split. No, he he wrote that whole thing. He like practiced that whole thing like on his subway trips for like a couple weeks until he could just do it entirely from memory. He wrote it all. His extremely talented roommates composed the music for it. My role on that was um, story editing, right? It was like we had this concept of let's do the, the pokey rap and then I helped him invent a bunch of narratives to sort of tie, to turn that concept into a story. Like the, 
like there are parts of that story that are based on his life that we got from like interrogate. I was like, all right, let's, let's find something actual, like emotional attachment that you have to, to a Pokemon in your life. And then let's try to find a way to make that a through line for this. So there's an emotional arc to it, as well as it just being a really good joke. Um, so that was mostly what I did. And it was super fun. Uh, and then I, then I did a combat role when we did the live performance. Uh, and synchronized dancing. For those who didn't see, the uh, initial reveal of the video at a PAX, I want to say East. East, yep. At a PAX East panel turned into a musical song and dance number that has become the stuff of legend. It was so it was it was so cool to have a, a front row seat for that. It was really cool. Like, um, people will proudly exclaim in video game dev circles, like, oh yeah, no, I was there. <laughs> like <laughs> Uh, sorry, uh, I can't get you the video right now, but I believe one of these lovely Mother Hubbards will. Um, um, very fun. But... Uh, yeah. Um, that Working on that stuff was super fun, too. Super different from, like, the video essay uh, stuff, but still, like, using the same sort of core set of being a person who has uh, deconstructed thousands of stories, trying to use that info to or that experience to construct a new one um sorry i was just uh one of the the big moments but i mean jumping back to my back um it's been a larger portion of the taking something that is incredibly dry mm -hmm. and turning it into something that is thoroughly entertaining that i really wanted to to focus on because the games industry struggled for a very very long time it's like how do we make people care about the stuff which actually goes into constructing it everyone says yeah. like ah, oh, we want more transparency we want to show users how games are made and yet mm -hmm. like you watch some of those uh, especially like early tutorializations around unreal and stuff like that and it is painful but recently you did a whole video on the gore effects around uh, dark tide Mm. Which then also showed things like um, combat logs for like Left 4 Dead and stuff like that for readability and things like that. Like, that is something that, from a technical standpoint, is drier than, you know, lightly air fried sand. And yet, it was fucking fun. Like, First, I mean, I thank you, but, but for, I think my counter argument is that it's not dry to a lot of people because there's a lot of people like us who are like obsessives right like who even a lot of people who haven't you know made money in the game space care deeply about how games are made so like hearing like how you know they use uh what was it uh, minimum screen space decals on uh on headshots in left for dead 2 like that's exciting for some people. Like, it's exciting for me. Like, one of my favorite YouTube channels is this one where, I forget what it's called, it, but it's just entirely dedicated to uh, this guy, like, essentially breaking down the code of Doom and under and helping you understand why certain things happen in Doom, right? Like, hey, here's how infighting works. Here's the part in the code that makes monster infighting happen. Um, I love that stuff. That's big and fascinating. Um, yeah. Uh, ooh. Yep. Sorry, yeah, Caffeine asks, have you ever gotten towards the last bits of an article script video and found someone else's that made you go, damn it, and go back to rewrite it with the new info? And I don't I'm trying to think of an example of that. Um, there have definitely been cases where I've been like working on a thing for like a few months or a few weeks, and then I'm like a few days away from being done with the edit. And then I will see a uh, somebody else's video will go up and it'll be on the same topic and it'll be like, oh, fuck. <laughs> um, and so usually I won't watch it until I'm done with mine. Um, but that happened with me and like I, I did a video about like where I tried to figure out the influences of Snake's martial arts style. And I'd written it like a few months before and then like another video came out on it like days before mine. Oh, no. And it sucks. <laughs> it's, it's hard because it's like the majority of the audience will understand that there's, that there's like, well, there is no way that Patrick Polygon just copied. Like, even if it was possible, like mechanically, if I had just watched that guy's video and then 
attempted to create it within two days, I wouldn't even be able to do that. <laughs> um, uh, but there, yeah, there are, there's sometimes like a portion of there, there's, first of all, there's guilt on my front from like, oh shit, am I going to be like eating somebody else's lunch by releasing this thing? And then it's like, oh, are people going to think that I ripped somebody else's thing off? Um, well, that's going to be a, a strange part of the industry to be in because like, you know, your, to my understanding, the bulk of your work over a Polygon is just, you know, video creation. Yeah. Um, but there are very few teams at the moment who have like a solid group of like video creators who aren't independent. So that's got to be yes. a very strange perspective, especially in like the, the YouTubian sphere. Right. Dude, it's, it's so weird. It's so, um, here's Pat's soapbox. I, I wish I'd had like a segment tune prepared for yeah. Pat's, Pat's soapbox. Yeah, r r raise my box like five pixels. Let yeah. everybody know I'm about to say something important. No, like, I, I like, think that... It'd be like the Grange Hill theme tune. Like, do 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 ba do do ba do ba do It's Pat Soapbox. I, um, <laughs> like, I, I love working with a team, and I would never want to not work with a team. Like, I don't... I would hate going independent, right? Like, I'm... I don't know. Like, I, would, I would lose my fucking mind trying to make YouTube videos independent. Like, yeah. without people to bounce off of, it's impossible. Right. I have these lovely mother hubbards. Like, right. You know, if I troll them on April 1st by playing Aliens Colonial Marines, telling them it's going to be an art house experience, I get immediate feedback on whether or not it's funny. Spoiler, I found it very funny, which means it was <laughs> successful. Well, that's good. No, actually, a stream audience is a good good workshop sometimes. But yeah, like uh, the 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 pant soapbox thing is that I get really frustrated with YouTube specifically. I get I get frustrated with the reality, <laughs> which is that like YouTube is a space that uh, rewards individuals, right? Which is good mm -hmm. that people are getting paid to do the thing that they love. But like, it's um, it's an extremely a la carte place where for the most part, especially within like games, takes and essays, people usually sign up for um, uh, a person, right? They want to hear H bomber guys opinions or, um, uh, you know, FD signifiers opinions or right. So it's, it's a thing where as a collective, we have this incredible advantage of being like to be able to bounce off each other and like work collaboratively and always have somebody to lean on. Um, but it's also like, it's like, a. it's, I don't know. It's, it's not the right flavor for the place that for YouTube. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, the part of the reason that bums me out is that it's like from a labor perspective, like YouTube, since that is a reality at YouTube, the result is that YouTube is designed to essentially drive content creators apart, right. To make, to separate the herd. Yeah. essentially to make them easy prey right <laughs> like um or you know disposable parts in this thing and i just wish there were more teams i, I wish there were more groups of people um working on things together i love collectives um <laughs> hey, Mr. the dog is upset about it too yeah um no no and i i totally agree with you um it's one of the things that and again this is i, I guess me being um like a, a fan of the content that your team puts out mm -hmm. is that by having a bunch of different perspectives in one place able to cover a lot of different angles it means right. that you're not in ever decreasing circles um hmm. because the one problem with the uh, the prolific personality approach is right. what we used to see in forums back in the day which is you have an ever decreasing circle in the the users expect X, and they expect more of X as X go as time passes. Mm. But that's impossible. Mm. So eventually, mm. there's always a decreasing circle because of that uh, continued focus and isolation. Yeah, yeah, and that's like even for like independent creators, right? Like I, I don't want like everybody to have. To, first of all, there are like fucking ten jobs doing <laughs> video left in in you know actual games media. But like, uh, so I don't, I don't want everyone to have to go work for a media company because that has its own like ups and downs. But like, I just wish that like the, yeah, that we could find 
ways to have the best of both worlds in that respect, mm -hmm. right? Like to have less less isolated content creators out there being entirely alone and just, you know, living and dying by their next video. It'd be sick if, here's Pat's pitch, ready? You make a, a YouTuber's union where you pool your resources. So then if one of you starts doing way better than the other one, every, other ones, everyone's like, yeah, okay, cool. Uh, instead of being like, oh shit, I don't, never mind, bad idea. I mean, oh. <laughs> that initial idea for the multi-channel network was always an idealistic one. Right, yeah. And I'm so, I'm sad that that, that kind of got balked because it was a great idea right. in theory. Right. Um, yeah. But rest in pepperoni, make a studio. <laughs> no. Too good for this world. Too good for this world. Um, Anyways, um, oh no, what it's... were you we talking about before I started complaining about how YouTube works? Oh, probably something. Uh, oh, I was asking about like you know uh, taking dry topics in the space. Um, oh yeah. But just uh, as a as a cap point on so uh, on Pat's soapbox is that this is important because this affects a large swath of the. I call it the game sphere now because mm. we had this whole theory that like. Um, in the same way that online media replaced print media, that the move to like content creation uh, mm -hmm. and more video focused would replace like traditional sites and journalism, and it hasn't. We've reached this weird kind of I don't know ecosystem where all of these pieces are all working together. Like now, it sucks for everybody, and I always like adding that because it sucks for game journals right now. Yeah, they're expected that they're held to a standard that's entirely unsustainable at the same time as being paid garbage uh the youtube space is not looking after creators and as you said is very much focusing on creative personality isolated personality um and the streaming space is incredibly difficult to find new individuals so like these these three kind of aspects of it are all living in harmony so no there is a mm -hmm. real value in what you're saying it's not it's not completely isolated because that then has a knock-on effect in how games are found and how games are understood mm -hmm. so like if if the games themselves are like the gravitational core these are the orbiting bodies and so mm. there is a knock-on effect there is value in this, yeah mm -hmm. um, yeah and it's, it's interesting to see like a uh, content creators getting into publishing now too like i know donkey launched his company um, do you want to open that can of worms with me because i have no. opinions i i mean I, i'll listen all right i'll try um, and do the speed one um so the tldr is that um i sincerely uh hope that their business model and stuff behind the scenes is very good the thing mm -hmm. that's got everyone worried is in the contract clause uh, or at least from what we understood, is that he mm -hmm. does want to have creative input. Uh, and that's the big red warning flag. Because you can mm. argue the others back and forth. Uh, the video he made announcing his publishing deal was openly and privately mocked by the entire games industry. Mm. Uh, it was... To call it laughable would be an understatement. And this is no diss on the guy, because he makes very funny videos. But... yeah. In his publishing announcement, he implied that he'd know how to make the next Hades. He'd know if he saw it. Everyone, everyone games in the side went, all right, mate, cracks knuckles, prove it. <laughs> no one fucking knows. Yeah. Every game is Hades until you actually have to fucking make it and release it. <laughs> and then, oh, oh, our lead creative uh, got pneumonia and had to be in hospital for two months. Oh well, that's a shitty thing that has nothing to do with game development. But now the production's behind. What do mm -hmm. you do? Do you give them more money to hope that they do make that Hades thing they promised, or do you hold them to the contract? Or do they then have to find a new creative and then change? But then they change art direction. Like a million things that change the possible greatest game ever made. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that. The title that they are releasing first is incredibly safe. Incredibly safe. And for a team that made such grandiose claims at the initial, we'll see how it goes. We'll mm. see how it goes. 
But yeah, the TLDR is what's got everybody worried is that he wants to have creative input. And based on the video he put out, he has no understanding of how games are made. Hmm. So that's that's the that's the compressed version without like right. wild eyed and spitting of like the donkey pitch that's he's shown no evidence that he understands how to take a game to market in the same breath as saying i want to be involved in how games are taken to market right what is the role for somebody um like let's let's, let's say theoretically okay donkey is very good at i mean I, I i will say i think donkey is is good at like uh, finding the finding interesting things to say about games and finding out uh, and articulating what makes a certain game good what is the ro role for that person in the game industry like super theoretically right like with, is that a designer is that is that person simply not needed because it's easy to know what's good uh, um, and it, but it's is, hard to get things done there is value in those kinds of some companies have enough budget that they can afford mm -hmm. to have consultants who come in afterwards. Yeah. But nine times out of ten, the team already knows what would have been needed to make it that little bit better. Like, right. But because of the two great constraints on games, which is time and money, because mm -hmm. of those, they had to not do certain things and had to make certain choices that in the end result in something that didn't do what they wanted. It didn't quite hit. Nine times out of ten, the team knows what it was. They just yeah. didn't have the cash or the money to, just had the cash or the time to make it happen. Right. Um, That's a, a very like a, a slightly similar thing happens in our videos sometimes, where there, there. First of all, there's no money, um, so that is not a constraint because there is no money to begin with. But the time thing will come up where like sometimes we will know precisely what it would have taken to make the video way better. Uh, but then it's like well, we, we had to put it out yeah. we had to it had been three weeks since our last video went up and we were I, we needed a video up you know about the sharpening edge theory of video editing right that like that those initial few strokes of the stone get the blade into how it should be but you can continuously sharpen the same blade yeah. and get ever decreasing returns like you know this uh, editing is is hard it's also very fun i admire your enjoyment of editing um I, I, back when i was at total war we did like a monthly youtube show and yeah. uh, editing that was always like a race against the clock um what, and, what were you cutting down from was it were you cutting down from scripted content or just like um like interviews uh so a little bit of all but for the most part uh <laughs> We didn't do scripts. Uh, we okay. would have bullet points that we had to talk about, and we just roll mm -hmm. the camera. Um, because okay. the thing I was talking to you earlier about, like really disliking um, that structured dev diary style. So yeah. there'd be there'd be a lot to cut through, but there'd also be a bit more of a like a genuine feel to it, rather mm -hmm. than you know what we've seen in other places. Um, but yeah, in terms of like the value of that, sometimes those long. Okay, no, no. So, taking a brief, taking a breath, because this is a sphere that you are in, and I mentioned earlier about like the good and the influence. When you're in the um, like pre-production and planning phases, or like early in production, let me tell you, sometimes sitting down and watching someone who has gone really into depth about one specific thing, and mm -hmm. allows you to have a shorthand of understanding why it is you feel the way you do about concept and design. See. Mm -hmm. I often talk about the difference between like the, the metric and the shamanistic when it comes to video games. Sometimes you just know something feels good. And sometimes you have like the data to back up like user performance and user behavior and things like that. And sometimes it's a it's like a weird capybara dance between the two. Like you have to trust your gut, but you also have to look at how people play video games. But you know mm -hmm. it should be, but you don't have the when it comes to those long form videos breaking down why certain things are exceptional it's an invaluable resource that you can return to and you can understand mm. um however you can't apply that to a prototype right you can't apply that to a vertical slice because right whether or not a game reaches its full potential when it comes to market that's just business and charting the seeds 
Yeah. You know, to stand up in front of a crowd and say, I can chart a vessel from here to here every time with no downsides and no delays and no problems is to mm-hmm. ignore the fucking sea. Like, yeah, that, I'll say that I, yeah, I, I, I've, I've learned more about how games have been made over the last, you know, however many years I've been doing videos occasionally getting to talk to devs, right? Not often, sometimes getting to talk to devs. The one feeling I haven't come away with is that I would be good at making games. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> nah, there's a, there's a level of you've just got to do it because the more you realize how challenging it is the more likely you're to not you have to have yeah. a certain amount of either uh chaos or arrogance to just be like i'm making a game right now <laughs> um, oh man but yeah so sorry i didn't mean to, to get so um so animated on that one that's okay um but it's you can encounter incredibly competent teams that produce banger after banger and then due to things beyond their control, they will, you know, they will publish an absolute stinker of a game. And that's mm. not because of anybody's fault, you know? Um, right. This, this, the thing that Dunkey hasn't uh, had to deal with yet is user expectation. Because mm. um, you've played a lot of Dark Tide, right? Yeah. This is a great one to talk about when it comes to user expectation. Boy, their community. Go ahead. Yep. Um... <laughs> They are the, we played it for a thousand hours, your game's shit and you should feel bad. Um, yeah. And I got to chat with some of the, the devs very briefly at GDC, and it was like, you know, they've gone through a lot of the feedback, and alongside the monetization of, like, cosmetics and things like that, mm-hmm. there was this expectation that Dark Tide would have all the functionality that Vermintide 2 had at launch. Right. And they're like, yo, we're still not a massive studio, like, this, this game's going to have more added to it, just like Vermintide and Vermintide 2. Right. You know, it's not all going to happen at the beginning, but the expectation is there. And Dunkey has done one of the biggest crimes you can do in publishing, which is stand up in front of everyone and go, I am going to publish the next Hades. <laughs> and it's like... Oh, I mean, that, that, that's a good point, Greybeard. Um... Yes, let's get it off of, uh, of Will's unhinged soapbox. <laughs> yes, sorry. Um, that's true. The the and in, in this case, it's it's uh, my employer's money. Um, is the the time that is or is what is being spent when I am grinding my ass away on a video. Uh, but yes, I guess what my point was: we don't have a budget. <laughs> um, uh, the budget be you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I need the budget. That's the same thing with video games. Like it's right. uh, aside from a few different uh, like external departments, the cost of making video games is the people in the chairs. Right. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So when I say um, like time and money, it's like how long can you afford to pay someone to keep making the game? Because when you run out of money, you can't ask someone, "Hey, can you just keep making this video game and not get paid?" Because we don't mm-hmm. have any cash anymore scary I, I was watching some of that um uh the double fine documentary which actually i need to finish that because that yeah. seems like it's going to be extremely enlightening but Yo, like they i uh, said so much publicly in that documentary that no one talks about like yeah it's a lot of content but holy fuck like i i have to only watch it in bursts because it's too real um like the whole thing about the team for the uh, rhombus of ruin being fractured off from uh, from Psychonauts 2 in that detail. Holy crap. Like, and you even talk about how basically it was a side project that they couldn't find the fun, and it yeah. caused people to leave the studio. Like, right. that happens all the time, and no one talks about it, because nobody wants to shit on their employer, but right. there'll be internal prototypes spooled up, and someone will be handed it, and then made to make it work, and it kills them. Like, and the, it, the, the prototypes are never usually announced or talked about, so these people just yeah. burn out and die and leave the industry without us ever hearing about it. Sorry. I, <laughs> I get very animated on uh, this particular no, topic. Well, I think it's worth talking about, right? Like, God, it's... 
the, the, the part in that um, doc where like Tim Schafer like has to show up and be like, hey, I, there's no more money. <laughs> yeah. Like literally, there is no more money. I borrowed a bunch of money to pay the last paycheck and there's no, it's so scary. Uh, it's, anyways. It's uh, um, yeah. I still remember uh, getting, God. Uh, sorry, uh, when I was at uh, Sega QA, we were on zero hour contracts. And I still hmm. remember the head of the department, the head of the, the QA operation standing up and being like, right, if you're not on this project or this project, you have till the end of the week. Bye. <laughs> And that's that's how it be. Yeah, man. Um, I, I, you know what I like? Social safety nets. We should get some yes, of those. I'd like some more of those. Anybody got one of those for me? I mean, uh, I'm very pro games union. I'm very pro uh, safety nets. There's a few people who are making rumblings about trying to do things more along the lines of like uh, independent collectives. So, mm. kind of what you were saying about like pooled resources, but in the space of you know creating indie titles and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I just want them to start doing it, please. That would be lovely. Yeah, it's it's um, it's hard because right, like organizing is hard, right? Even if it's a group that's small, right? Even if it's a collective, that's that's you know, it's a lot of it's a lot of social management, right? Like, and it's hard to have the the blueprint for how you're going to establish hierarchy or if you don't have hierarchy how are you going to deal with uh you know conflict and stuff right it's and especially with a group that's really small like a collective it's easy to start having like personal feelings that like oh well this person doesn't always shuts down my ideas it's it's personal right or it's yeah. like uh yeah it's there, there's room for that stuff to happen. but i really want that to happen too um and i especially in games also in games media right that would be sort of a dream of mine to see more like employee owned uh games media operations get off the ground like i know um these are all games adjacent right now but like uh the drawfee folks the folks who used to work at oh epic yeah um a friend gave us a a voucher to a nearby bakery oh yeah sorry mate. yes fuck all right, I'm gonna need dinner for this. But yeah, no, uh, the, the, the <laughs> folks who worked at this website, Drawfee. So Drawfee was this, yeah. for those of you who don't watch Drawfee, it was like a YouTube channel where like funny people would like draw stuff together. And uh, they had wonderful personalities and they'd come up with fun segments. I think they were owned by Dorkly uh, oh God, yeah, or College yeah. Humor. And then they got, I think, I, I don't remember if they got fired or if shuttered or whatever. Uh, but they they went employee owned, right? So now they they own themselves, and they they're still making stuff, and still a small group of people, right? And they are the stakeholders. Mm. There's no like as long as they are making enough money to buy delicious baked goods every month and make their rent, they are a success. Yes. And that's like really what I want is like groups of people working on things that are good and fun to watch and people enjoy and then the success of it is like well did i get to buy some nice baked goods this month yes okay we're doing good um zalavir uh zalavir uh, nelson calls it the uh the pizza money theory but that's a that's another kettle of monkeys um, yes in gaming we have some happy stories like this uh the sock pop collective is a trio of creatives who primarily produce video games oh, yeah. with a patreon model but they right. also sell them on Steam. So they're able yes. to just create titles uh, as weird and as wacky as they want in that space. Um, I don't know, uh, Bad Fox, I don't know who put the, the monkey in the kettle. I, I keep bringing it up. No one solved the problem. Um, but yeah, the the Sockpop Collective do a very, very good job of creating like small, sustainable titles with the potential of any of them to like explode. So mm -hmm. with Stacklands, for example, that sold gangbusters. And that's just one of the titles they put out. Um, right. God, they probably put out like 60 to 100 games at this point. Right. Um, and that's funded by Patreon. So they're already at a like uh, a crowdsourced model of income. Uh, but I think the crowdsourcing is a slightly different situation. Yeah. Um, I haven't experienced it yet, but I have friends who are on that space, and it, it, it seems like in some ways it seems good, in other ways it seems scary in different ways. Um, yes, you, yeah. you have to do a lot of 
additional interactions with people. Um, but then again, like, so I'm able to do this full time because these right. lovely Mother Hubbards basically go, Oi, all right, here's, here's a dollar in bits. Here's two dollars. Like, that's right. what keeps my dumbass alive and allows me mm-hmm. to... I mean, again, the baked goods were a gift. Um, a friend I did send us uh, a voucher, so like... <laughs> J-Post, thank you for the demonstration. Thank so, you, J-Post. Uh, I'm in a yeah, very yeah. weird spot. Yeah. I th- Like you are talking about like that collective, right? You have, Where you have one game that does really, really well, right? But you're doing a bunch of games. And like the thing that like... The world slash future that I... I, I want in both you know making videos about games and making games games is a world where that can happen and then but being the person who made the one that didn't get a lot of views that particular time doesn't mean you're fired yes right it's like it's like yeah um and that was like sorry (laughs) creating something that isn't mass appeal but high engagement has far more value when you're working as part of a collective right uh, currently, at least to my understanding, YouTube's model is still based on like ad revenue and the ilk, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 pure volume, and it's um it's tough because right like it, to <coughs> people who are doing well on YouTube are doing like what like uh, Mr. Beast getting like a hundred fifty million views per video, right? Yeah. Like, and I'd say successful is like you know five to ten million views. Like w- <laughs> we are not that at all. Um, we are far, far, far from that, but like, so in a sense, we, we survive because we have, we are part of a larger machine and also we have sponsorships and stuff and Mm. those honestly like sponsorships. Yeah. A single sponsorship probably like covers like five to 10, what we probably make just on ad revenue a year. I, I don't actually know that for a fact. I don't look at the numbers, but that's where it gets scary. I mean, yeah. I'm lucky because I fucking love video games, and so if someone hits me up and says, uh, "Hey, uh, we'd like to we'd like to do a sponsored game. We'd like to sponsor you to play a game for a day," it's like, well, right. I already love your game, and now you're making it so that I don't have to worry about you know groceries and living. Oh yeah, 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 stuff like yeah. that. Right. Um, oh yeah. So yeah, I mean, speci- so we don't do a lot. We we we've started doing like um, non-endemic stuff. I th- we, we did a, a sponsored stream for like the mobile version of a PUBG game. Um, and I think it was the first time I ever worked on a uh, sponsored thing about a game. Um, usually we stay away from that. Um, but like when streamers, like in general, like, but in, in that case, it was the same thing. It was like, well, we all had like tons of experience with PUBG and it was like part of our streaming identity. So we're like, yeah, well, well that makes sense for us. Mm. Um, but... As a smaller side, I didn't take it, but um, <coughs> using Twitch's like backend bounty system, they had a bounty for a mobile game called Goddess of War Nikkei. Yes, I watched my friend stream that. <laughs> that fucking intro! What the shit? Dude, I wish it's I'd so streamed bad. it now. Yeah, but I it's was like, awful. It's so obviously like you know, uh, if you'll forgive it, just like boobs and ass. It's literally right, yeah. designed so you're either looking at cleavage or a booty. Yes. So I was like, I'm not going to stream this. This is obviously... But I played it because I wanted to know what the fucking deal was. And it has one of the most brutal openings. One of the most, like, absolutely pitch black, whiplash tonal moments of any game I've played. It was absolutely a thing where it was like, I, I watched my friend stream the whole thing. And then it was like, God, I wonder if the, the people who made this have any sort of problem with women. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's just like, yeah, like you said, it's it's boobs and asses, and then just a scene of like extremely rote violence. Very, and that that specific thing is a big anime trope, right? They're like, oh, I'm too fucked up. You gotta kill me. Um, thing like I'm I'm not a pretty lady anymore. You gotta whatever. Bad game. Don't don't play. Uh, oh, yeah, don't what play. was it called? Something Nikkei. Um, it's God. It's an experience. Okay, yeah. so jumping back, jumping back, because yes. we've um, we we I don't want to stray too far into the darkness. Oh because, yeah, sure. Uh, Let's do it. YouTube especially goes into that place, but 
like I'm gonna go for a light and fluffy question. Yes. Um, of your uh, polygon content, what's been your favorite video to produce so far? Yeah, hmm. I, I know I'm asking you to pick your favorite child here, but yeah, there's, there's well, I mean, be it's one. kind of the opposite. It's asking me to pick which of my children I want to kill the least. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um. Uh, Oh yeah, Amazonian is a really good streamer, Air Dragon. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. Um. No. If, 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 there there are videos that are really fun to work on, and then there are videos that I like, um, and sometimes they're the same videos, but like, a lot of times I will really, really, really not like a video, and by the time I'm done editing it, I will despise it, and then I will come back, and then I generally find that I can come back like six months to a year later and really like it okay um and sometimes like enough time has passed that i'll like i'll be laughing at the jokes that i wrote and i'll be like oh i forgot about that joke and i surprised myself with that joke <laughs> um yeah uh I, I think my favorite is i think practically speaking and like legacy wise the one that i'm like when i you know if i were to retire tomorrow the the fighting game one is the one that i like the most because writing it was easy because it was like I had spent a couple years just doing this, getting into fighting games because I loved it and because I was having a really good time doing it with my friends. And I had already done all the hard work of learning how to learn about fighting games. So writing it was just like a matter of just like, well, here's what I did. Um, and then seeing that one, I think that's the one where like I've had the most people like tell me that I've had a practical impact on their life, right? Like I'll have somebody come tell me like, oh dude, I, I got into fighting games because of that. And now me and my friends are obsessed with with Guilty Gear Strive and we love it, right? Heck and it's, yeah. Somebody told me like specifically they got into karate because of it, where, where <laughs> nice. it's just like, because there was still, you know, a lesson within that video or sort of the, the sentiment I was trying to convey in that video is that like, like if you, jump into something that you think is hard you might end up having a new kind of fun that you haven't had before um yeah so that video i think is one of my favorites and then in terms of like criticism and stuff and insight i when i go back and i watch the truck nuts video i do think like oh yeah i got that one <laughs> i nailed that one um yeah um uh, Will, I almost spat a uh, croissant out of my nose when you said, ah, oh, yeah, it's Catch-22. Wait, I always get that mixed up with Sophie's <laughs> Choice. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So, uh... Oh, I'm sorry. You know what? Hunter just threw in a straight-up fluffy question, which is always Ooh. a good one. Tell us about your most recent tabletop RPG character. I'm thinking... I'm thinking. <laughs> do, 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 do. So I, I really wish I got to do more tabletop stuff because I've only done it through work. Uh, I had I had a Pathfinder group once, um, like ten years ago, and we only did like three sessions. But every other tabletop thing I've done has been for like actual play stuff for work. Um, I'm trying to remember what the most recent one was. I think I was like a. Uh, fake Tom Waits kind of guy in like a musical fantasy thing that my uh, old co co-worker Jenna put together. It was very fun. Quite cool. Um, yeah. Uh, as a small aside, have you gotten to do Divinity 2 yet as a group game? Uh, so not for work, but I have actually at, later tonight, I, I got to make sure I'm off this call by nine because my Divinity group is meeting. <laughs> We play Fortnite now, but we're still a Divinity group. <laughs> uh, that game is so fun. I love that game so much. Yeah, I've I've started it twice with two different groups. So yeah, it's it's I'm trying to find a team that will see it to the end. You know, after having tried a couple times, I think it's uh, I don't know if it's a great co-op game. Like, like I I feel like. Mechanically, it is brilliant, the fact that it works at all and that four people can be moving around in this world. I think the thing where I get in, uh, or maybe it's just specific to my group, but like 
I don't think we're engaged enough in the story to be actually like thinking hard about the decisions we're making okay. and the combat system when you are only focused on one role on that team out of managing the tactics of four different people starts to just feel like hurry up and wait while you're, you know, there's really only a certain amount of correct moves to be made and you're only making the moves for one of the chess, the pieces on the chessboard. Um, but God, the game is brilliant. Actually, um, I, I will take this moment just to abuse both your time uh, and uh, this yes. here platform. So Goodbye World Will is um, one of the individuals responsible for um, uh, Before Your Eyes, the blinking emotional narrative title. Uh, and they recently announced a tabletop RPG, unrelated nice. to the previous question, but yeah. Uh, give it a check out. It's, uh, I think it's made its initial Kickstarter goal, so it's doing good. Sick. Hell yeah. But yeah, um, see, I, I love that whether you're invested in Divinity 2 or not, it allows you to be both... Um, uh, what's the term? It allows you to be both sincere and ridiculous. Mm. Like, uh, at the end of Fort Joy, you know, when you finally have your confrontation with the Warden, if someone is hiding... They can continue to walk around yes! in a barrel we did during the cutscene. I nearly vomited laughing. You would I... judge me. I am here to make sure the law of the land and people are safe <laughs> as a barrel is going around and fucking stealing paintings off the wall. Yeah, from a design perspective, that game blows me away over and over. And how how D and D they made it, like how stupid the solutions can be if you want them to be. And it's so fun. Like, I, I think we, sometimes me and my, my friends would like cheat the game a little bit because I think you can transfer, um, uh, excuse me, uh, inventory items, even if you're not close to each other. Yeah. So we were all trying to get across this ravine and like one of us had like a pair of gloves with, with teleport on them. So we're like, well, let's just like, I'm gonna go across there and then I'm just gonna throw you the gloves. <laughs> and that then we whole, got all across the ravine The like whole that. bit where it's like the infinite death you have to walk across, anything that touches right. it. And I'm like, I'm a fucking skeleton! Whee! <laughs> yes. It was fucking great! Uh, uh, and I'm not just saying so this good. because I want to revisit the character of Lord Calcium Bonio, um, <laughs> uh, who is, what if Skeletor could say fuck? Um, Currently, he, he would be sitting behind me, but I had to do some VO this week, which was really good fun. Oh. Uh, he's currently in the living room. Uh, I forgot I left him out there and scared the piss out of my partner the other morning. What, what she... is what is he? What uh, Is he a model? Uh, you know what? I'll just show you. Get him, please. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk just to the chat for a second. All right, mate, you need it on set. Yeah, Air Dragon, like, mechanically, it's just so cool that it works at all. And, like... How thoughtful, like a lot of the, how thoughtful, like a lot of like the, the stuff is like where you know you can just like, oh my god, there he is. That's so good. I'm a big fan of this. Lord Calcium Bonio. I, I love a skeleton so much. Skeletons rule. Hello. Oh, his headphones aren't in yet. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to my life. We're just talking about how much we like skeletons. Oh, Have you yeah. seen Evil Dead 2? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, dude. The, the, ske the top tier skeletons in that movie, just the rascally ones, the ones that are always like... <laughs> That's essentially my my personal goals as a as an undead creature is to become that. Yes, they're not uh, nice guys. Sorry, we uh, wildly careened from topic to topic. Uh, so mm. how long have we got your company for? If you have to rush off for a uh, gaming group. Mm. Yeah, I'm sorry. We should have. I, I should have asked uh, how long this was. Uh, usually we start around like nine. Uh, sorry, which is uh, six your time, I think. Okay, so we've got you for another like. 10, 20 minutes. Yes. Okay, so let's open up the pit. So friends, if you've got any questions for Patrick, like now's the time to throw them in. Feel free to either at Pizza Suplex, which by the way is a great fucking username, uh, or at me in chat so we can see them. Uh, yeah. Whilst people are writing their questions, Moose was just putting forward another compliment on the Truck Nuts video. 
saying that uh, honestly they spent some time with Anthem trying to figure out the mechanical side of why it didn't really land and really the conclusion I got wasn't far off the Truck Nuts video so um, nice. I just they had Neil Bloomcam do a fucking live action trailer for it like uh, oh. Sorry, one of my other um, ridiculous research topics is uh, marketing marketing campaigns that biff it. I'm obsessed yeah. with them. Oh, I love those too. They rock. Um, oh, God. Ooh, Vert and Flo, do you have a favorite game that is also bad? Yes. What, uh, what, I what love... I have, I have a weird, huge soft spot for... And, and I feel bad calling them bad, but uh, the... Um, uh, the jedi games where you're like a, a super powerful goku jedi who's the most powerful jedi in the world and he's darth the vader's Force secret son unleashed yes yes you pull a fucking the, star destroyer out of the sky yes and they're like they're I, I think like the critique of why they would be bad is because they're like super repetitive right and the story is rote and stupid but i had fun literally the entire time because you can like they gave you full three axis control of a stormtrooper when you're like doing force choke on him for oh, yeah. no reason other than it's fun to do it um, and let us not forget the best dlc of all time where you replay right. the original star wars trilogy but the bad guys win and it's just you wrecking the hoth base and shit like that yeah yeah that game is fun um yeah most i think most of like the good bad games that i like are sort of in that vein where it's just like yeah it's a game that like Re reviews poorly because it's super repetitive or tiresome um but it's also yeah. incredibly bland protagonist and yeah the story outside of everything was just you could see it coming a mile off and it was dull but... mm -hmm. yeah a <laughs> uh, huge soft spot for it though i, lo I love to replay that one uh, i know uh Chonoris asked this earlier and gravy was asking as well anything that you're looking forward to games wise that's coming out Ooh, super excited for Street Fighter VI. These are all going to be boring answers. I'll try to think of a cool indie game to tell you. Uh, <laughs> but no, it's, it's all it's all the big tentpole shit. I'm super excited for the new Zelda. It looks so fun. I want to build, build a kill dozer. Um, uh, Tekken 8 is going to rip, I think. Yeah, um, I might have to get a fucking fight stick again. God, I'm so excited for that. Um, as an aside, infinite respect to people who can stream fighting games well, because I can't. I just get too mm. in the zone and forget to, like, say words. Ah, oh, yeah. Satan! Thank you. <laughs> it's fun. Uh, it, it, no, that that is hard. And that that's another, like, self-esteem thing, where it's like, I gen genuinely... I've gotten to the point where I trust that my audience isn't going to give me shit if I'm doing a bad job. Um, and if they do, it'll be funny. Um, but it, there's still this fear that like somebody good is gonna come into my chat and see me playing and be like, Pff. see, mine's the other side. It's not that I'm worried that people are gonna judge me. It's that I'm gonna forget they're there. That I'm oh, so in yeah. the fucking zone that like the tunnel yeah. vision comes in and I'm right. just there. And I am. Now, also, I'm a bastard. I play as uh, Li Chao Lan pretty much exclusively. Hey, no, that's valid. That's He's okay. He's an asshole. Li Shaolin rocks. No, he does. The, the, the best Tekken player I know plays Lee. Yeah, he's got like frame advantage on like fucking everything and a bunch yeah. of weird janky moves. But he's not easy to play. He's not easy to play, but yeah. yeah. Um, no, I, 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 I kind of find that streaming fighting games sometimes makes me, definitely makes me worse at performance in the game, but not the th I, I, I try not to tune out from the audience that's there, so I try to keep talking. And the, the good thing that comes out of it is I end up talking through what I'm doing verbally mm. a lot of the time, which helps me understand why I'm doing the things that I'm doing and notice the patterns that I'm performing in the fighting game. So then I can be like, oh, I keep doing this. So then I can stop doing that. Yeah, it is. Um, a, and it yeah. is good when you have a bunch of people who can deconstruct like your, where you're not evolving. Right. Um, so jumping back into chat, uh, Lance did yes. point out one thing about um, the Force Unleashed that made it brilliant was when if you Force pulled one Stormtrooper, he'd sometimes grab onto yes. his buddy and then yes. do them both. And they'd have that yeah, like Disney moment of, don't you let go! I'm not going to let go of you! 
Yeah, and then also one of them could like grab onto like a crate. So you'd have like one guy holding onto another guy's legs and that guy's grabbing a crate, like one of the classic Star Wars like crates with a line down it. And they're like, ah. Brilliant. So um, good. Real Hunter once again giving us the top tier questions. Favorite giant robot? Ooh. It's yes! Cherno Alpha. Alpha Cherno. Yeah. The big pneumatic fists. I loved all the uh, the the Jaeger designs in, in Pacific Rim, but Cherno Alpha was just like so good, so so. Good. Like I like that is like it's got like square hands. Yeah. He's. He looks like a nuclear reactor. It's so on the nose. I love that. I think that's the thing that I discovered partially while making the the character design video is how much I love it when uh, character designers just fully do visual puns. Yeah. Um, uh, My Hero Academia is really good at that, where it's just like <laughs> yep. the, the guy with an explosive personality will literally have like grenades for hands. Um, His hair is literally an explosion going outwards. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there's some cute stuff like that in Street Fighter. Like the, it's less of a visual pun, but like, uh, like the new character Manon, she's like a judo ballet hybrid. So like all of her stuff is this really clever integrations of like ballet movements and judo throws. Mate, you say um, they're not doing like visual puns, but the new grappling lass, who's meant to be like a Spartan, has a fucking Spartan. You're right. Hell you're absolutely haircut. right. Yep. 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 You're absolutely Subtlety, right. Subtlety, not here. No. Yeah. It's great too because she wears a helmet, so she'll take the helmet off and the haircut under There's it. There's another helmet. <laughs> it's kind of like someone gave her a bowl cut around the feckin' yeah. helmet. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Um, um, feckin' yo. Uh, caffeine with what is your preferred beverage, either alcoholic or non? Ooh. Uh, I don't drink a lot of beers but when i do i like an absolute like trash lager i just like a a, a miller high life or a pacifico or have you tried visiting the united kingdom they may be able to sort you out with trash lager i was born there what yeah ipswich fucking what <laughs> yeah <laughs> um my story is i was born in fucking cali i was moved to the uk <laughs> when i was like a year old <laughs> we're backwards backwards buddy <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Uh, oh, um, yo. Um, oh, and Sadeland, like, I'm super down for custom, uh, even janky shoebox controllers. I just, because I learned to play Tekken on a stick, I can't play Tekken on a pad. And if I have to, I'll actually play it like I'm playing a stick. So I'll get it on my lap and yeah, I'll yeah. kind of cuddle the thumbstick and tap the buttons. That, uh, that's how uh, Lil Majin plays. I mean, that's how pretty much every um, pro player who uses a uh, PS4 pad, they, they'll do like thumb, regular thumb, but then they'll have it resting on their knee so that they can do the uh, arcade style taps on the buttons. Yeah, Scotty, um, and this explains the Grange Hill reference earlier on Pat Soapbox. Um, uh, whilst the more questions are coming in, actually, I did want to say if Polygon has the budget, Please, 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 please do come to um, GDC next year. Um, I don't, I, I think we get to like, again, so this is the thing where we send like one person if we send somebody and they're the person who we know is going to get scoops and make connections. And that is not me. <laughs> well, um, then see, like work out if you can do it on the, the fucking, yeah. on the cheap. Because one, as Will was saying, control all GDC is an incredible experience. And mm -hmm. like the custom controllers are always incredible and inspired. Um, yeah. But also, like, as someone who nerds out on how people make games, getting to stand around with them and find out all the wild shit is fucking brilliant. Like, the talks yeah. are good, but just going to the Unibuena Gardens and hearing the tales of how people broke game engines to make them do stuff. Um, last year, I got to meet the guy who made uh, Frog Fractions, and... <sighs> I wish I'd taped every bit of that conversation because he was yeah. incredibly funny and just... You know when you meet people and you're like, cool, you're an actual honest-to-goodness genius. I'm, I am I am but a small rock with googly eyes on it. Please give me give me the tiny rock your wisdom. It's cool when you find those people and they're also willing to talk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. 
it. If you all have any final questions before we have to let uh, Patrick make a move in a bit, um, now is the time to throw him on in. Um, Get in the pit. And actually, jumping back to Pacific Rim, yeah, I, I know we keep coming back to the Truck Nuts video, but I think it is perfectly surmised in the difference between Gypsy Danger and then the the final uh, the final tier mech that's supposed to be the new hotness. Right. How that one feels bland, despite being the next level up, whereas Gypsy Danger is still a bit wrong. It does have a big yeah. hero symphony, but it's got that big hulking great big circle. And right. Like, there's, there's something weird and awkward about Gypsy Danger that I love. I, I think it's it's that the design is, is is like super anthropomorphic in a funny way almost. Where like so like the, when I look at uh, uh, Danger, the the, the two uh, clearest elements I see are like gunslinger and football player, right? Yes. The shoulder pads. Right, so it's just like this jock wandering out onto the battlefield, and like that's like, super American uh, in a really fun way. And then I think it's a little harder to tell what's going on with uh, the Australian mech that's like the new hotness. But I think part of that is okay. So it's that one is supposed to like evoke fighter jets and stuff, right? It's supposed mm -hmm. to be like a hotshot fighter pilot vibe on that one. But I think we're so used to seeing like the military iconography applied to Mecca, that it doesn't stand out as uh, here's the mech that looks like a jet plane because every mech we've seen has borrowed elements from yeah. military industrial design. Striker Eureka. Uh, Striker Eureka, thank you, yeah. Now, um, if we wanted to go down a mad deep rabbit hole, I'd talk about how the Timberwolf, aka the Mad Cat, is one of the most iconic designs from Mech Warrior because it's fucking weird and janky. It's a Boeing 747's nose with legs and laser arms. Googling, Googling. I, I used to, I inherited a pack of Battletech cards. Yes, this motherfucker. This looks yeah. like ED-209. Yeah. Um, if it was built out of somebody's leftover plane. Sorry, yeah, well, it's, 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 it's a B-29's nose, not a Boeing. I see. Speaking of ED-209, that's another good thing where a design, a good design is literally just stealing a literal other thing is they're like well let's make it look like a huey helicopter because we want to like evoke the sense of sort of uh surveillance and uh, oppression from above that like people had sort of absorbed over the course of like the vietnam war seeing hueys fly around vietnam so it's like okay let's put a huey on legs oh actually um, so i apologize that this is essentially me inviting myself into your nonsense but if you ever want to do anything about G Gundam, you call me, all right? I'm not a Gundam watcher. Mate, it is mech wrestling. Yes. Where every oh. mech is themed around the country it's based on. Okay, yeah, no, my, my co coworker Clayton was telling me about this one, and he told me that there is a Gundam that rides a horse, and there is a horse inside the horse Gundam. Yes, but the yes, thing okay, I worked cool. out recently is the Nether Gundam, the Gundam from the Netherlands, which transforms into a windmill. Now, yes. we know this. It makes it into the finals because the the preliminaries are a battle royale. Everyone's just yeah. dropped on Earth. They find each other. They have a battle. If you win enough fights, you make it through. Or if you survive, the Nether Gundam flies into a bunch of windmills and then hides as a windmill for two weeks. But the thing that just hit me is that in G Gundam, you're not in a cockpit controlling it. You have like this weird skin tight like latex mm -hmm. suit that the Gundam matches your moves, meaning. That bloke spent two weeks pretending to be a fucking windmill. <laughs> that was where he had to do that. I know, I need to watch this one. Um, yeah. I just, I, because uh, I've obviously watched a, a ton of your content and the, you know, wrestling is everything video is a really, really good example of like the influence of wrestling and video games and things like that. And G Gundam <laughs> is, I mean, the opening, they literally put a laser ring around the earth. The wrestling analogies are there. And you are you're saying everything that I need to hear right now. <laughs> yeah, let me have let me throw one more at you. Uh, Jiminy Crockett, um, the pilot of the America, the Neo American Gundam, is a combination gunslinger, football player, and surfer. But when he gets into close combat mode, his uh, American football shoulder pads fly off and become boxing gloves. <laughs> doing the Kermit well, thing where he just scrunches up and starts shaking 
<laughs> I need to see that. That sounds so good. Yeah, it's on Crunchyroll. You can watch okay, it right yeah. now. And the English language dub, in, in like impeccable. Really? Okay, cool. That that'll help too, because then I can multitask and I can like draw or something while I do it. Yeah, uh, um, because everyone doing the English language dub just goes ham. Okay. Fuck yes. Why okay, does the introducer wait. at the beginning of every episode wear an eye patch that he pulls off? Never explained. Never explained. <laughs> wait. <laughs> <sighs> Right, Gundam no, Fighter! Oh, Ready? I'm so excited. Go! You're gonna love it. You're gonna love it. Okay, great. So good, so good, so good. Um, th- Wait, you said something about a different Gundam in there that I wanted to ask you about. Oh, Jiminy Crockett. Uh, First I think, of all. Uh, Jiminy Crockett is the pilot. Pilot. Yes. Very uh, funny name, because it sounds like Jiminy Cricket. Also related to wrestling, Jim Crockett was the promoter of one of the greatest... Uh, pre WWF wrestling federations, the NWA. Oh, I didn't know so that. I wonder. Uh, I'm lucky I enough wonder. that uh, a good friend of mine, Fred, and um, a bunch of people here are super wrestling fans. So I get to know all the stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I, Without that... the awful burden of being a wrestling fan. Well, it's I'd like <laughs> to be, but just staying con, uh, just staying up to date with video games is. Uh, a full-time job i don't know yeah i want to be a wrestling fan as well Mm -hmm. life is not giving me the time right now yeah but lance just uh was very impressed at the uh jim crockett promotions reference jim crockett knew how to make that magic happen oh yeah and also davy crockett that's so good oh favorite wrestling anime fuck i don't watch wrestling anime what are the good ones I've, was, I've seen the one where the cats wrestle each other. Um, okay. I was hoping you'd be able to give me good wrestling anime recommendations. No. I, I mean, wrestling is anime. My favorite wrestling anime is uh, uh, Katsu, uh, Shibata versus Okada, r- the retirement match that accidentally retired Shibata. It is, that is an entire season of it. That is an entire 500 episodes of a shonen anime condensed into... 30 100? minutes yes condensed into now, one emotionally speaking it, oh, okay. i'm not talking plot wise i'm just saying like it has like you know all those moments like a shonen anime where you think the guy can't go on and then he does something incredibly cool and dangerous and then the part where there's just like two guys hitting each other who clearly love each other uh it's it's, it's all of that in one of the best wrestling matches i've ever seen i might that watch that tonight glorious. yeah the only thing that I can really say about wrestling is that there's a Portland wrestler who looks like my eerie doppelganger. Mm. Um, so I, 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 I've, I've seen a lot of indie wrestlers who kind of look like you. So uh, my goal is one day to try and sneak in there with like a big cloaked, cloaked hood and do the, Hello, brother! I'm you! <laughs> <laughs> you should! You should do that. The thing is, I am not physically really fit enough to wrestle, so all I can do is the intro and that is it. Yeah get really really tired right away i think that'd be a good gimmick for a wrestler is the the, the guy who gets tired very quickly done, mate. Oh. Oh. Get, you got this i had a big lunch <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little snooze over here oh lordy lordy um yeah so yeah friendos if you have any any last five questions before we got to say goodbye uh, what I will do, though, while we're doing last five questions, is for those of you that don't, uh, please, 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 uh, do follow Patrick on this Twitch uh, Pizza, it's Pizza underscore Suplex, isn't it? Yep, you got it. There we go. Hey, thank you. Thank oh, you no, thank it's you, all good. You. I mean. Uh, oh yeah, Orange Cassidy. I, I know Orange Cassidy. Have you seen any clips of Orange Cassidy? Yeah. The, okay, uh, yeah. the umbrella maneuvers and everything are glorious. Um, he's he's the he's the guy who always has his hands in his jean pockets and oh, the sunglasses. Yes. No, that's the. Yes. Sorry, I get him mixed yeah. up with the other guy who's the very who's the smaller ginger with the brolic. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, hey, yeah. Th- thank you, everybody, and thank you for for hanging out with me. Um, oh, dude, like this was fucking that was cool, fun. and and I really hope that we can figure out what the hell is going on with your Discord. Uh, well, so it's definitely something that's changed Windows side because it's any video. Like, wait, so I, how are you doing this? Oh, so basically, my main monitor is just you and me 
in a um uh, i see in a google call right um, and i'm doing everything on the same window where the streaming software is interesting okay i wonder if it's a graphics card thing then because if it's something with like moving it to a second display uh, could that be it, but if it's uh, if anything takes over full focus i see okay it pauses it just completely goes away so Wild. you're not wrong it could be graphics card related it's... or it could be windows update but it's only <laughs> happened in the last like 24 hours i'm really sorry for ending your stream by just trying to do tech support for you <laughs> it's all good i mean <laughs> Thank you for helping me try and fix it before we got started. <laughs> no problem. There was a uh, there was a weird bit of like disconnect where we went from like oh hey, you know for the brief moments that Twitter exists, I'm a big fan of your work. Would you come on my show to help me fix this problem, mate? Like it felt very like office friend <laughs> before it even said hello. Yeah, it's um, uh, it's good though. That that helps me feel normal. I, I love to I love to. To fix fix other people's problems. <laughs> I, have, I have so many, um, but no, no, it's been an absolute fucking treasure having you on. And you know, I would love to have you back in the future. Um, if you ever need an excuse to play Sea of Thieves on a Friday night, um, that's our, one of our few regular fixtures. Oh, cool! Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Let me know. Um, we I'll be the, around. We did the GDC of Thieves last week. Nice. How, how, what are you running with with a crew of four? Oh what yeah, you, you get a galleon. Oh, of course. Yes. Um, our current two main galleons are either mine, which is the Alone in the Shark, um, or uh, Very good. M's. Uh, theirs is uh, the Sink Shaming. <laughs> you think pirates came up with puns that good? I hope so. I mean, pirates were drunk. Mm and hella queer so it's only natural True. that puns would come into that space yeah i think that makes sense um also very bored oh yeah that's exactly the kind yeah. of people who would have time to come up with puns <laughs> ragnar with this was the longest uh, off-topic tech support call of all time <laughs> I actually had some really good ones of those lately because I discovered that one of the guys who helped out with our uh, like product support, like our, our um, video editing support, was like yeah. a huge fighting game fan. So just like initially, it was like we would. I was like, "Hey man, I'm having this. It's taking fucking ten minutes for Adobe Premiere to boot up." And then he came over and he's like, "She's like teching on my screen. He's like, what are you, uh, what are you working on?" And we're like, "Uh oh." <laughs> <laughs> so then just yeah, pretty much. Uh, I had a very good friend on the IT team because I know about Tekken. Yeah, once you once you speak Tekken, um, God, though, uh, I used to stream from inside the GameWorks in Seattle for a bit. Um, mm -hmm. uh, they just had me as their resident streamer, and what was incredible about that was I'd finish this show here and I'd totter over to the upstairs bar, and they'd put Evo on, uh, and it would usually be on like during the week like moving yeah. up to the, the finals and stuff so it'd just be me drunk as a skunk watching professional tech and being like no oh, mate no you should have done it like this <laughs> like i was those like drunkards <laughs> watching football in the bar you know the kind of guy that threw his shoulder out in his teams and he's like oh i could have been somebody There's yeah I mean, we like... need what we need is we need like songs like y'all do for your uh your sports over in the uk we yeah. need those for for watching esports we, we do. need um, annoyingly, because I've been kind of put on the spot trying to remember like a British chant from a sporting match, uh, the only thing my brain can think of is Lizzie's in a box, and that doesn't really help with Tekken. But that one was fucking funny. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> oh, God. I mean, you could just go for the classics. Ooh, oh, yeah! <laughs> was, was it, the, 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 I, I'm the leader. I'm the leader of the pack. Uh, and then there's... No, that was Alvin Stardust. But I, I thought they did that at football games too. It has been a while. I've been oh, to okay. one stadium match in Okay. I like this Jim Kazama <laughs> bloke. He looks like he can right handle himself. <laughs> <laughs> Devil Jin? What is he? A bit leery with a pint? Oh, I tell thee. That's that can't be right. He's got lasers when coming out of his face. When will they put a British in Tekken? We need a British in Tekken right now. Uh, what's fucking... Is there any British guys in there? Hang on. Probably. 
I don't know if there is. I think we got Steve Fox. Uh, Steve Fox? You're right, Steve Fox. Okay. There the we go. So, uh, is. Uh, Mr. Tekken, hook me up. I'll, I'll voice your next British character. Jobs are good. I'm dead cheap. I'm dead cheap. <laughs> <laughs> 50 p in a bag of skips. Let's go. <laughs> They, well, I mean, they extract those uh, hurt sounds from the, the actors just by whipping them with reeds. So uh, get ready. That is a well-known um, fact. Um, for the grapplers, they use planks because they need to have like a meteor sound. Mm -hmm. um, my friend actually voiced a character in uh, Guilty Gear Strive. And yeah, he said oh, the, sick. The, the beating sessions were pretty intense. But <laughs> uh, no, it's um, uh, Alex or Octopimp. Uh, oh, yeah. Did, okay, uh, cool. The British character in that, which was fucking brilliant. Right, yes, uh, uh, Axel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hello there, Mr. Tekken. Boy, have I got a subpar deal for you. <laughs> Sweet. Okay, I I should probably eat some food before game night, if if I'm if I may. Yeah, no, no. Uh, go, go. Uh, About Patrick. Are you gonna keep going, or am, am I leaving? What's happening? Well, now? so uh, if I do want to keep going, I actually have to bring the stream down, change some things, and bring it back up again. So I see. Uh, either way will be uh we'll be having a bit of a of a move around okay um because I, I need to try and fix this problem before we continue so it doesn't break anything else um yeah. but no um patrick thank you so much for your time it's fucking great to meet you and it's fucking great to have you on the show mate yeah thank you very much for for having me on this was really fun and it was nice to talk to you and it was nice to talk to your nice people as well okay um uh dear friendos i am going to skip credits for just a moment but i will be saying proper thank yous if we manage to do another stream later all right so friends go forth find cool people on twitter um twitter no fuck twitter to, uh, to cool people on twitch and uh, to be continued all right again 